I beg to remind senators that when the Senate rose, the question was that the appropriation 2017 2018 bill be read a second time. Minister for Local Government, Culture, and Creative Industries. Mr. President, I rise in support of this budget, a budget I have assessed as a treatment plan to restore our beloved country. Mr. President, I say treatment plan because our country was hemorrhaging. It was hemorrhaging from a barrage of internal and external wounds or blows, which forced passionate institutions like myself to come out of our comfort zones to lend a helping hand to the rescue mission, of course. You see, Mr. President, when the patient goes into intensive care, professionals are needed, not amateurs. And from all indications, that's what we've seen. We had amateurs, and even at this point in time, they're nowhere to be seen. We need professionals, and we are quite happy, and I'm quite happy to be a part of this team. Permit me here. Mr. President, to specifically thank the people of Castries, and particularly those from the East who pulled me out. And I also want to thank the Honorable Prime Minister for granting me the privilege to serve in this Honorable House where changes are expected to be pronounced. And I say pronounced because that's where you say it. The public servants execute it or they make it happen. And of course, it's legislated right here. So. Changes are expected to be pronounced and legislated in this house. But Mr. President, the Economic and Social Review, and I've heard quite a few of my colleagues quote it this morning, on page six, it reveals that St. Lucia's economy grew by some 1.9% in 2015 and 0.9% in 2016. Mr. President, I'm no economist, and I know we have a few economists here. I'm no statistician. But what I understand very well is the vibrations of my country. You see, Mr. President, vibrations are important signals and undertones that truly reveal the state of happiness of the people. And so while the economy appeared to have realized some measure of growth in 2015 and 2016, Whatever the data showed, the vibrations were not positive. Our people were still suffering. No jobs, no hope, nothing running, and they were not happy. I want to refresh your memory, Mr. President, on the vibes that prompted the change in administration on June 6, 2016. And I'm doing so because a people must know where they came from if they're going to determine and appreciate where and how they can move forward. Yeah? These were the vibes. Economically, we had a repressive tax regime with VAT at 15%. Everywhere you went, or everywhere I went, I was hearing nothing running. Miss nothing running, no work, our unemployment, the level was exceedingly high. 21%, you understand, across our economy, 21% unemployment. And of course, among the youth, it was even higher. Businesses were folding up, particularly our small businesses in our communities, which are the lifeline of our economy. We are a small country. And I'm thinking of people like Miss Doris in Pave, and Miss, Ma Miss Maria in Pavi, Miss Marie, sorry. And I'm also thinking of Emily's Boutique, which used to be on Brazil Street. Miss Angela in Menard Hill. Miss Leona in Bagatelle. Sabi's Restaurant in Beaufort. Susie's Boutique in Soufre. 
And the list goes on and on across the country. In terms of our security, we had impact blues. Yeah? Across the world, St. Lucia was known for this impact blues. St. Lucians were worried. We had a demotivated or rather a demoralized police force. I can still hear the echo of the president of the Police Welfare Association, Mr. Cameron Law, he was at the time, crying out for help on public radio. All that time, our women and children were being raped. And worst of all, our forensic lab was out of commission and did not have the capacity to assist in resolving the cases. But yet the country spent millions of dollars building this facility. It was supposed to have been a savior to us. Didn't happen. You want to hear more, Mr. President? You want to hear some more? In terms of the social issues, there was a lack of appreciation and respect for our diversity as a people by our leaders. We have a health system that was in total chaos with no end in sight. Millions of dollars spent. Millions of dollars. Millions of taxpayers' dollars spent with no end in sight. And I'm hoping that we can hear a little more about the end um, of this plight of our health sector. And of course, we had an education system that was crying out for help in the fundamental areas of childcare development and the teaching of soft skills, basic manners, basic grooming, simple things, our education system was not equipping our children in the way that it should to be able to live the life that we would want as citizens. We have a generally weak family structure with no focus nationally on the importance of that network. And I say this as very seriously because even now, when I listen to the stories of families who come to me every week, we're in crisis and there is a lot of work to be done to heal wounds in terms of families, and to connect people, and to get that network right. So there is a lot of work to be done. Affair, Mr. President, we had a general atmosphere. By June 2016, we had a general atmosphere that was not conducive to engaging. People were angry, they felt trapped, imprisoned, and were looking to break away. And if you recall, Mr. President, St. Lucia's mantra in response to this was, break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. That was the mantra. And in people's daily lives, they ask for divine intervention in this land. And I just hope that they continue to pray because it's through our prayers that we are here today and we're all proud to be here. That was the reality. We all know it. And above all, we all felt it. And I emphasize felt because there is a difference in feeling and hearing. Everywhere I went as a St. Lucian who travels ab abroad, everywhere I went, people were asking, what's going on in St. Lucia? What's happening to St. Lucia? Everywhere we went, national teams going away and people were asking, what was going on here? So where are we now? Mr. President, 12 months on, in this new administration. And as a student of psychology and sociology, I have seen and noted how this new government of the people, for the people, and by the people has been pro providing, sorry, competent, intensive care and begun to heal the wounds. It is generating a new type of vibe with a schedule of treatment that spells change, change, change. And real change. Change that is focused on a reorientation of the mindset of our people by creating very deep vibrations. And all the changes taking place, and all of these changes are taking place within an atmosphere of respect and understanding of each other, which is the foundation for a peaceful society. That's what this government is all about, a peaceful and prosperous society, and we're working on this. So let's look at some of the change actions. Mr. President, this treatment plan, this treatment plan is indeed about rebuilding our country. It's about inspiring confidence in all of us so we can stand up and be counted. It puts the growth of the economy into focus and the social development agenda of our people at the fore. 
it gives hope. In here, Mr. President, we have a series of strategic actions that will yield and inspire a renewed sense of hope and well-being in our citizens. Mr. President, let us take a look back at some of the deliberate actions of this new administration which has aroused our people. Yeah? We have woken them up. And so the first action, Mr. President, and the first order of business for us was our swearing-in ceremony, which was an all-inclusive affair. For the first time, it was held in an open public space in the town of Viewfort. People were shocked. They were excited. But Viewfortians were elated that their community was chosen to lead that change. A simple activity which sent deep positive vibrations across the country. Vibrations that signaled to the people of the South that the development of their area was going to be a priority for this administration. This is what we did. That's the first order of business. The second order of business, which was another phenomenal departure from the norm, was the announcement of the cluster of ministries. A different approach and structure which demands consistent dialogue and engagement and ministers working in teams. Citizens for weeks were in awe. Many sought after information and clearer understanding of how the clusters would work. I remember somebody saying to me, but you, you are lesser minister to Spider? You understand? Because Spider seemed to be in charge of the cluster and you are inside the ministry. How, how is this working? So we found ourselves providing a lot of information on how it can work and why it was different, and why it was necessary for it to be different. That's how real change works. There was a search and thirst for information, and of course, people were demanding and asking questions. The important thing is they were inquiring about the new government structure. They were asking questions. So we shook them up, and that was happening, and we were happy. So that's the second thing we did. The third thing we did, Mr. President, and that's the next major statement on inclusiveness for us was the right right here in this honorable house we pass the legislation or the amendment to the election act that ensures elections are or nominations sorry are not held on majority worship days right here we pass this ensuring of course that there is no obstacle whether philosophical or psychological to participation and that no politician at no time can play no cynical games and self-serving psychological games with the fundamental right of any citizen of this country. We must respect and facilitate the right of all citizens to participate in this once in every five years historic opportunity. We have to stop playing games with it. And so right here, we pass this legislation. Yeah, right here, we did that. So that's the third thing. So we're shaking the politicians up too. So we did that. The next thing we did, and the list goes on, but I was, the fourth one we did was the Crown Proceedings Act. We passed the, the amendment to the Crown, Crown Proceedings Act to ensure that proceedings can be pursued against anyone, anytime that there is evidence that the state had been wronged. The message here is that the government will not tolerate any corruption and it will pursue those who have wronged it. But I hasten to add, Mr. Pre uh, Mr. President, that the execution of this law, in particular, is heavily dependent on the systems for accountability and transparency which are to be effected by our beloved public servants. I note that the Director of Audit, and I think I have a report somewhere here from the Director of Audit, the Director of Audit in her report for 2015, 2016, in this report, for my colleagues, in this report, she highlighted, she spoke to or she highlighted the lack of effective systems and risk management plans on critical projects resulting in cost overruns and wastage in government. We need to do something about it. And that's the job of the public servants to do. This government means well. We want to avoid corruption, but we need the public servants to assist us in ensuring that the systems within the establishment are clear enough 
so that it cannot happen. So we expect our public servants who are key to helping us achieve this to be proactive and work with us and be vigilant, yes, my friend, Ed, to be vigilant and help us to prevent harm being done to the state and ensure that those who harm it face the consequences of their actions. This is the only way we can achieve what we try to do with the Crown Proceedings Bill. Mr. President, there are many more examples of change actions. The Jazz Festival, the NICE Initiative, the list goes on and on. But what I know is that these, or for a fact, is that these changes are for the better. And if we are honest, we will all admit it. I am certain, Mr. President, you will agree with me. I'm certain, Mr. President, you'll agree with me. <laughs> that they were bold and daring. They were bold and daring, and they were raising the consciousness of our citizens as never before. And that's why we are where we are today, because the citizens have been shaken up. Yeah. We've shaken them up, and we're quite happy. But Mr. President, within all of these gestures that I've spoken about, are important pillars for building that new St. Lucia we talk about. The pillars of inclusion, inclusion, the pillars for respect and understanding the pillar for participation, and the pillar for accountability and transparency. These are the pillars upon which this government operates by. And I understand government well. I've done it for 34 years. And I could tell you from sitting with my team, that's what we are all about. Understanding, engaging, participating, working with people to realize change. There's sometimes you have to be bold and daring, and there's sometimes you have to sit back and observe and watch what's happening. We are at a point in this society where we need to push. We need to shake people up. And I think we've been able to do a good job of doing that over the last year. Mr. President, I really want to acknowledge the Honorable Prime Minister, Alan Chastney, who from all indications is a transformational leader. And I'm not just saying it because you heard my colleague mention it a while ago. Yeah? He's a transformational leader. He understands how this society works and is indeed focused on making the necessary changes for all of us to build that new society. He knows that harsh and hard decisions must be made if we are to move this country from its high state of dependence to one of independence, where citizens recognize that they have the power to determine their own destiny. Mr. President, my prime minister, a prime minister I'm happy to serve under, he is fearless but respectful and we must commend and admire him as a country. Mr. President, leadership is not for people without gumption. It's not for people who are thin-skinned. It's not for people who cannot face the opposition, you know, or face their opponent and, or, or run away and run away. It must be for people who are not offended easily. It is for people who, who are prepared to engage and when they lose the debate, they accept their defeat, but they go back and strategize and come again and try to do better next time. And that's the message we want to send to the young people of this country, that when we lose, we have to go back, work hard, and come back and fight, and not just give up easily and run away from the house. That's boyish and childish. And so one must have the gonads, and it's unfortunate I don't have the two balls, because I had a, a softball, I had a softball, Mr. Prime Minister, the soft sponge ball, and I had a campo we used to play cricket. And I was going to show the difference in the two. But for some reason, I guess it was divine intervention. I, I, forgot, it, I forgot it at home this morning. But one must have the gonads to stand up like a Sir John did when as leader of this country, he publicly retorted that sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can do me no harm. That's the mentality we want to be able to lead us. And so in the last four years, I have seen all types of insults and abusive language hurled at our Prime Minister. Today he's our Honorable Prime Minister. He has been abused. He's been abused and tested. He's the Prime Minister today. And we've seen all of the woes. You know, I personally want to assure St. Lucians, as somebody who served in government in my previous life, I want to assure St. Lucians that our Honorable Prime Minister is indeed prepared for the challenge. He is focused and very clear on the mission. 
all the signs of real positive change are there. And I'm convinced that we will not be disappointed. Now, the opposition knows that very well, you know. They know that very well. And that's why there's a concerted effort to create mischief and negative vibes and trying to catch at straws. And we all know in our students' companion what they say about people who catch at straws. It's drowning men who catch at straws. And so every school child from grade five or even four would know that that's what drowning men do. So, Mr. President, in the last year, under the leadership of Prime Minister Alan Chastney, we have seen every indication that our democracy is alive. And not only alive, it is very well. Because some of us are alive and we're almost dead. But our democracy is alive and well. Our people are even renewing their own commitment to actively participating in developments around them. The National Trust, Adrian, the National Trust, you're my colleague, Senator, has seen significant increase in its membership and even its programming. The National Youth Council has been revitalized. Our telecoms providers are recording increasing sales because we are a lot more inquiring and we're talking. Yeah? The Catholic Church is moving into uncharted waters. Our Calypsonians are having a fantastic season. Yeah? All of this, you know, and the list can go on and on. All because we have a leader who is facilitating and leading a real change movement. If you recall, Mr. President, about 12 months ago, just think back, 12 months ago, our favorite phrase was, not a word, not a word, not a word. No one dared speak out, or no one dared cry foul. Our citizens, and more critically, our leaders, they feared reprisals if they stood up publicly on any issue. So we are in a good place, certainly a welcome change. As citizens, we know that we can protest without fear. They can even be assured, and these citizens can even be assured that we on this side of the house will give them a listening ear and representation if needs be, because we are a government, like I said, of the people, for the people, and by the people, and we listen to the vibrations of our land. So we acknowledge the efforts of our Prime Minister, Shasne, for the consciousness creation, consciousness raising, that is needed for change. And I say well done to him. And St. Lucians must all understand that it is not business as usual. They must wake up and smell the coffee. And we want everybody to wake up and smell the coffee and be part of that journey with us. So, Mr. President, <laughs> I'm very happy to be a part of the change team. And in the cluster of the Ministry of Equity, Social Justice, Empowerment, Youth Development, Sports, Culture, and Local Government, the agency responsible for the happiness of the people. That's what we are. We are the agency responsible for the people's happiness. Mr. President, our vision is for a society where people, no matter their ethnicity, no matter their political affiliation, no matter their religious persuasion, no matter their educational level, no matter their social strata, that they have access to services that are facilitated to empower themselves to participate in nation building, freely expressing themselves and realizing their potential for the glory and honor of our beloved country. And so, as a ministry, we propose to ensure that in this way. One, by deliberately reaching out to our citizens in every nook and cranny of the country with a structure that includes tentacles that reach the grassroots. For too long, you have some agencies that are not connected on the ground. And so we are hoping through our new structure that we can reach every nook and cranny of the country to ensure that people feel a part of the process with us. The second thing we are doing as part of that strategy, Mr. President, is that each area of the country has its uniqueness. It has its own resources. And so we will create the environment for our people to collectively take ownership and contribute to nation building with, with that unique flavor that each region or district of the country brings. The third thing we're going to do is by affording and creating opportunity through constant engagement, constant dialogue for showcasing our development of community resources. 
and harnessing those for the economic and social development of the country. Through our extension services across the cluster of ministries, we will connect to and obtain feedback from communities and as many citizens as possible, whether it be in public assistance, in the arts, in sports, in youth, in community development, and in the staging of festivals and events. We will, through our local government system, stay in tune and facilitate the empowerment of our people and give them autonomy in the management of the resources within their jurisdiction or their jurisdictions. We have had some excellent models in Sufre and most recently in Castries, and we'll be looking to replicate that model in other communities across the country. You see, Mr. President, the ministry represents the pulse of the nation. And so the staff of the ministry must connect with the people at the grassroots. They must connect. And we want everybody in St. Lucia to know that if you're representing the ministry of equity, social justice, empowerment, youth development, sports, culture, you have to be on the ground with the citizens of this country. That is the only way this ministry can achieve the goals that it wants. We need to stay connected with them at the grassroots. So the staff themselves must be efficient and effective in the delivery of the services that they have to provide. They must see themselves as that link to fostering a better society. They are the presence of government on the ground. They must embrace that responsibility for programming and creating the environment for balanced living by our citizens. And so, Mr. President, because of this critical function, our ministry will be reorienting and continuously training and strengthening our staff capacity to ensure that they are focused on the mission of facilitating empowerment. You see, Mr. President, when people are empowered, they become self-reliant and self-sufficient and in command of their own destiny. And they are happiest because they have a great measure of control over their being. This is where I was as a human being. This is where I was. And this is what I would want for all citizens of this country. This is what I want them to enjoy, that freedom, having that state of mind that you recognize you have control over and you are not easily persuaded by those around you. A type of mindset that propels one to relish a challenge, to be optimistic and focus on improving one's community. We need our country, we need our citizens to get to that point. It will take a lot of work, but this government is prepared to take us there. So in this budget, if you refer to the standard object classification schedule, you will see a total allocation of $97,000 representing the investment in staff training, etc., for this year. With respect to culture, Mr. President, and as the Minister of Culture and Local Government, I have been privy to many studies, many reports, which have been undertaken in both areas, you know, and I have all of them here, you know, a whole stack of reports and studies, you know, <laughs> reports and studies, <coughs> National Cultural Facility Report, since 2011, they've been searching for a new place. You know, we have the consultancy to prepare regional strategic plan. We have the creative industries bill. We also have policy, strategic and institutional framework. We have a sound diplomacy report with respect to music, you know, and, and the list goes on and on. So I've got quite a few reports, Mr. President. And I certainly want to thank the previous administrations for the work that has been done in all of the areas. And also all the consultants who place their recommendations before the government of St. Lucia, which was sitting on the shelf. All of these were sitting on the shelf. Sitting on the shelf, nothing running. It's now time for us to act. And we will continue to build on where the previous administration left off. And where they never took off, we will take off. So we have begun the process. We've begun implementing step by step, program by program, one at a time. With respect to the legislative agenda, that's one of the most critical areas for us, Mr. President. There has been some work done in both areas of culture and local government. There is a draft creative industries bill, incentives bill, and a draft local government authorities bill, both of which will receive attention from us 
this year. We will also commence a review of the Copyright Act and visit the 17-year-old national cultural policy with a view to assessing its relevance and making it more applicable as we focus on developing the creative economy and our heritage tourism. There is also a draft, well, I mentioned a draft creative industries bill a while ago, which we, we mentioned already. But one of the other things we've done, or one of the critical things we've done this year, Mr. President, is that we have established the events company. And I know we've been talking about this events company for the last maybe two decades. But the events company is now here. And the events company has been established specifically to enhance efficiency in the production of national events and festivals, and also to increase the contribution of national events and festivals to the culture, social, and economic development of our country. The events company has delivered two events as part of the Soleil Summer Package. And Mr. President, the verdict is not yet in, as we do have four more major events this year with the events company. And we would prefer for St. Lucians to evaluate us by the end of the series. I think for us, that would be a better assessment. While internally we do our own assessments, we meet our stakeholders and engage, but we would want the nation to give us that evaluation and scorecard at the end of the series. But for us, this was an important step in redirecting and linking our culture directly to our tourism products. And we are happy that we have been able to begin this. We've started it. So we're happy. We've begun a new process. <coughs> Mr. President, I want to thank the board under the guidance of Mr. Donovan Williams, a very cooperative and professional permanent secretary. My heart goes out to him at this time, Mr. President. As you know, he and his wife, Jackie, lost their, their, their daughter, along with Jati, I think, another writer in, in the creative industries. They lost their daughters just recently in a tragic accident. And so, as a nation, we mourn with them, um, and we extend our sympathies to them as well. But I want, to, I want to thank him, and of course, also thank the board of directors of the event St. Lucia, Ms. Agnes Francis, who is also going to be leading the tourism authority. We have Don Shalwe John, an expert in the field of tourism. We also have Mr. Daniel Belize, an event planner. We have, of course, Ms. Leandra Vonil, um, and of course, Lampreys Cherubin. These are, that's the team that has been working with us, underneath, of course, and receiving good support from people like Yves Renard and other people in the industry. I also want to compliment the staff of the events company, headed by the CEO, Mr. Thomas, Mr. Thomas Leos for sharing the people's vision of St. Lucia and understanding the need and value for constant change and improvement. We look forward to the remaining events with great expectations. Mr. President, we also wish the team well as they continue to collaborate and network with other established agencies, in particular, our Cultural Development Foundation, the Folk Research Center, our communities, as they work to develop the events for which we have made increased resources of $12 million available this year. With respect to the Cultural Development Foundation, Mr. 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 President, we see this institution as pivotal to the development of our culture and creative industries. The CDF must continue to move from its current psychological position of backseat passenger to front seat passenger. In this era where the arts is expected to contribute a greater percentage to our GDP, the CDF is expected to lift itself and take its rightful place in the development of our society. It must lead and it must be given the assets and tools to do so. We are conscious of that. We will spare no effort to ensure that that happens. Our folklorists and our artists, in particular our, in particular, our young ones, they must see the CDF as an institution that offers opportunity for enhancement of their person through culture and the arts. And the CDF must be appropriately structured to respond to that need that we have. In the last year, though, we've seen significant programming by the CDF. The institution has tremendous potential, and we will be capitalizing on that. In the last year, they did the Soundwaves project, and that was a, a, a project designed to transforming youth at risk through music. The project costed 420,000 United States dollars. 
with uh, the CDB contributing a total sum of 380,000 and the government, of course, contributing the other 20 something thousand. The program catered, of course, to disadvantaged youth from across the country. They came from all over, Sufre, Viewport, Chosel, Castries, you name it, all over. And it, provide, it provided training in critical life skills, as well as information technology, music, theory, performance, um, recording, engineering, business development, marketing, special emphasis on business for the music, and of course, web, web page design. The CDF is also working in tandem with partners like the CDB, the National Skills Development Center, the TVET unit within the Ministry of Education to ensure that our young people who are trained, not only in this program, but in all areas of the arts, that they are able to receive certification and qualification which they can use in the marketplace, and not only in this marketplace, but globally as well. Honorable Minister, you have 10 minutes left in which to complete. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mr. President. I, I will try to... to Finish up in 10 minutes? Um, yes. Honorable Minister of Health. Um, Mr. President, I wish to invoke standing order number 35 to allow the Honorable Senator for Local Government, Minister for Local Government and Culture. Um, 30, 30, 20? 30. To allow her 20 more minutes to complete her presentation. Okay. Honorable Senators, the question is that standing order 45 free be suspended, be invoked, sorry, to allow the Senator an additional 20 minutes in which to complete her presentation. I now put a question as many as of that opinion, CI. Yeah. As many as our contrary opinions, you know. The eyes have it. The eyes have it. Minister, you have an additional 20 minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you, colleagues. Mr. President, the second component of that CDB project is a very interesting one. It speaks to the construction of a recording studio which the trainees and other disadvantaged youth can access. It is expected that this initiative will give a boost to the creative to creative expression in music by making it possible for disadvantaged youth to record their musical compositions and improve the market on, and improve market access and so we are working with the cdf to realize this studio for disadvantaged youth an interesting note though is in the new genre of music creolingish or what they call kuduro which has emerged here more particularly in areas like denary sarot and ancillary. And Mr. President, we support this development and we will continue to assist our musicians in the development of the craft, as well as launching that music regionally and internationally with the assistance of agencies like TIPA, which have expressed strong commitment to the recommendations in the consultancy from the international firm Sound Diplomacy. Mind you, Mr. President, a key principle that will guide our work in this area is that the lyrical content or the lyrics must be uplifting and inspiring and not denigrating any gender or group in our society. Additionally, there is need to ensure that our local indigenous music receive more airplay. And over the course of the next year, we'll be working with the media owners to discuss this issue and how we can work towards the transformation of the music industry and giving more airplay and more time to our local musicians on, 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 the, on the airwaves. With respect to the creative industry, Mr. Speaker, or I mean Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, we are actively expanding the offerings in culture and creative industries. And this is one of our major priorities, or one of the major priorities of this new administration. We have already established the events company, and over the course of the next year, we'll be working along with the Ministry of Education in delivering a school of excellence for creative arts by 2018. This school will nurture and cultivate a, a, cultivate a culture of entrepreneurship amongst our people, supporting the need for diversifying and growing the economy in non-traditional revenue generating areas. You understand what I said there? The school will nurture and cultivate 
the, the school will nurture and cultivate a culture of entrepreneurship amongst our people, supporting that need for diversifying and growing the economy in non-traditional revenue generating areas. Mr. President, we also have established a small grants program. It was there before and we continue to, to work with it. A total of $200,000 has been allocated. It serves, of course, to support artists and artisans in the development of the craft. We have fine-tuned the criteria and only those artists who are registered in the cultural mapping program of the Cultural Development Foundation will be able to apply for consideration. Another important sector for us, Mr. President, is the film sector. Recognizing the significant revenue generating potential for film, the Department of Creative Industries will continue to engage all stakeholders with the intention of realizing a solution that benefits our country. Mr. President, we must stop losing. We must stop losing out on box offices who have approached us consistently to film here. Too many opportunities have passed us by as a country, and there is lots of revenue to be earned from tapping this lucrative sector. And so we'll be working on this ASCP. I guess it would be remiss of me if I don't speak to the Carifesta issue, Mr. President, but permit me to indicate again that I am in receipt of the proposal for participation in, for Carifesta. Given the fiscal constraints, our government will only provide a measure of support that hinges on the ability of all involved to contribute to the expenses to facilitate their participation. I have also requested of the CDF the selection process. The object here is to be satisfied that every St. Lucian who chooses to participate in the arts and who wish to one day represent St. Lucia in the arts, that they have an avenue and an opportunity to so do. So whatever we do, we need to ensure that every child in every part of this country stands a chance of getting there. Carifta is the pinnacle of our regional, of our, our, our local events. That's what we aspire to go to. And so we need to ensure that every St. Lucian who is involved in the arts across the country has a fair chance of making it there. And so we will support the team, but of course that team needs to come and say, this is what we can contribute. We have to break the cycle of dependence on government for everything. The artists, well, we understand the challenges that they have in selling their products locally, but equally we believe that if it is done properly, if it is marketed properly, they can generate a lot of revenue and of course assist in the process of getting themselves out there. With respect to local government, Mr. President, we see it as an avenue through which we will deliver the services and facilitate empowerment of our citizens. In this new era, we expect each council to be able to account for its people. Councils must know where the vulnerable people in each of the jurisdictions are, and they must, target it. they must target them. And that's what the ministry is currently working on, a system to be able to target with the local government councils all the people who are on the ground in those communities, those who are suffering, those who need care, those who are well off, we need to know where our people are. And so we're working on this. Across the country, we have appointed those councils and of course, many of these people we've appointed have been involved in the development of their communities for years. We are indeed proud of these leaders. And Mr. President, I would just like to mention their names. In Grosley, our chairperson there is Mr. James Edwin. In Babano, we have Mr. Evestrus Ive John. In Castries East, we have Ms. Rosemary Pierre-Louis. In Denry North, we have Mr. Aloysius Cumberbatch. In Denry South, we have Ms. Gabriella St. Paul. In Miku North, we have Brenda Paul. In Miku South, we have Mr. Arson James. In Viewfort North, we have Mr. Paul Sunny. In Viewfort South, we have Mr. Um, Orichi Dembo. That's a lady, of course. In Labry, we have Mr. Henry Amity. In Chosel Saltibus, we have Mr. Brian Charles. In Soufre, we have Mr. Pius Grand, Grand Gardine. In Canaries, we have Mr. Andre Lansico. In Ancillary, we have Mr. Stephen Griffith. And in Castries, we have Mr. Peterson Francis. Now, Mr. President, I want to highlight the fact that in setting up the councils, all of our parliamentarians, all the elected parliamentarians were invited in accordance with the 
the Constituency Councils Act to make nominations. All. I want to applaud those representatives who responded to the invitation to be a part of this established system for inclusion in our democracy. And I want to chide those because you have those who come here and speak, but they refuse to accept the basic responsibilities for the people. And they know themselves. The message will reach the desired persons. But the show goes on. Mr. President, let me take this opportunity to applaud all the councils on the work that they have done to date. In particular, Mr. President, I want to commend the Castries Constituency Council on the valiant effort, particularly the mayor, his worship the mayor, Peter St. Francis, has made with his team to begin that process of restoration of pride in our city, which turned 50 years of age on 11th March 2017. Mr. President, I can safely say, with respect to the human resources at the City Council, we have found the right mix. We have a mayor who understands the vision, and it's always important for people to understand the vision. And I heard my, my colleague, Senator, um, independent senator, speak to sharing that vision. And so the mayor understands the vision and the direction that our country is headed and where the city fits into the scheme of things. He has a good understanding of that. The city council is now professionalized. In all areas of management, we have the right pegs in the right holes. Our team of professionals are guided by the law, ethics, an understanding of the environment, and an, <coughs> and an understanding of the value and the process of revitalizing that city of Castries, that wonderful city that gave birth to me. We have been realizing much returns due to, the, we, <laughs> we've been realizing much returns due to efficiencies and effective use of the resources of the council. In fact, companies are owning up and paying the taxes with ease because of the renewed confidence in the operations of the council. And you know, Mr. Mr. President, I just want to bring to your attention, when, when the team took on the council, they found a situation where there were a number of phantom workers. And in one case, there were 72 phantom workers earning $38,000 per fortnight. When the mayor did his checks through the system, only 13 of these people were legitimate. And there are many more situations like this. But he's done a good job. And we're dealing, we're dealing with the situation. But Mr. President, I want to add that the Castri City Council has taken a new approach. St. Lucians would have seen the transformation of the building. And it's not just the building being repaired, but it's a building maintenance project, which is being pursued in keeping with our agenda of developing that culture of maintenance around our public buildings. We believe that if we want the business community to spruce up their buildings and enhance their surroundings, we too must be do likewise. So we are building a new St. Lucia by not just talking, but setting the example. And so when we saw the removal of the vendors around the pavements of the Ave Maria School, I guess a lot of people were happy about this. You know, but for me, it was a real shame that as a country, we had allowed a school, you understand, to be abused in that way. You know? And I think it was so sad and if there was a disaster, Mr. President, the children in that school would have all perished easily. And so we're happy that the mayor took steps to address that problem. And you ask the question, where were we the last 20 years? Where were we to allow that kind of chaos around the Ave Maria Primary School? With respect to our city police, we commissioned it last year and we are continuing to explore synergies with the Royal St. Lucia Police Force in working to ensure a safe and secure city for all through the community-based policing strategy. So, Mr. President, we commend the mayor again and his team and applaud them for being transparent in their undertakings to ensure that our city becomes the most favored place in the Caribbean to do business and have fun. And they're doing this with 
the same allocation, the same allocation, the same allocation, and I say same a hundred times because it seemed to, people seem to believe that they're getting more money. The same allocation of $4 million per year from the government of St. Lucia. So we continue to give them the credit for the work that they have done and the, what they've been able to achieve. Mr. President, I mentioned earlier uh, that in the coming year, we will be refining the draft local government bill, and we will be working to institute a local government election regime for implementation by the next term of local government. With respect to capital projects under local government, we have received an allocation of just over three million, and it is anticipated that we will complete the Sufre Town Square, <laughs> the Groselet HRDC, as well as provide some much needed equipment to some of our human resource centers. There is also some provision for the electrical wiring at the National Cultural Center. Mr. President, in these hard economic times, the government continues to substantially contribute to voluntary organizations, under the, the voluntary organizations, particularly those under the remit of the ministry, and there are many of them. But for youth development and sports, a total of $844,000 is issued to organizations. In social justice, a total of $1.7 is issued. In culture and local government, we have $14.2 Of course, $12 million goes to the events company, and the remaining $1.6 goes to the Cultural Development Foundation. Mr. President, I shudder to think of what our society would be like without these organizations and the many volunteers that serve them. These organizations represent the soul of our nation, and we will never be able to repay them for the tremendous work and positive vibrations that they create in our society. The sense of family they offer, the structure they bring, the consciousness they create. And they are there are many of them under the remit of our ministry. And I speak of organizations such as the Homes for the Elderly, and the vulnerable, the differently able, the uniform groups such as the Red Cross, the St. Lucia Girl Guides Association, the St. Lucia Cadet Corps, the St. Lucia Scouts Association. You have the Junior Achievers. You have the National Youth Council and its affiliates, the District Youth and Sports Councils across St. Lucia. We have the SDA Pathfinders. We have the National Sports Associations. You have the Folk Research Center. Mr. President, I salute them. And I also salute the sports groups. I salute the under-16 or the under-15 team that won the fourth consecutive Winwood Islands Cricket Tournament just recently. I also salute our young cricketer, Kiana Joseph, of the current secondary school, who is a current member of the West Indies women's team. The last time we had a women on the team was in 2000, 17 years ago. You understand? Our women made the team. And so I acknowledge her, and we recognize her, and we compliment her. I also acknowledge our boxing team that recently won the OECS championship and note the current effort by the Boxing Association to establish its own headquarters to continue to contribute meaningfully to the development of our country. I applaud the St. Lucia Olympic Committee, which is, will formally open its own headquarters for its membership of 20 national sports associations in the coming, month. in the coming months. I want to recognize individuals like Mr. Peterkin, Richard, who continues to serve across the globe as an ambassador for St. Lucia for sport. He also serves as treasurer of the Continental Body for Sports and on the International Olympic Committee, which is the pinnacle of sports. He's there, representing our interests as well. And he represents the entire region as well. I also say well done to the uniform groups, maintaining discipline and order, structure, and challenging our young people. I also want to rec record the passing of Commander Lawrence James. This is a young man who served the Cadet Corps for years. He was a reporter for sports and youth development. And Lawrence was a professional who was as cool as a cucumber, but resolute in his work. Mr. President, the work of these organizations is too important for us to ignore in forums like this or forums like this. That's why I chose to spend some time on the vibes that they bring in the hope that more of our people will seek them out as avenues to contribute meaningfully, particularly in the era of change that we are in. We cannot take them for granted. St. Lucia recently hosted the Queen's Baton Relay. Her, her, her Excellency, the Governor General, received that baton, which signaled the commencement of the Commonwealth Games. And of course, the Games will be held in the Gold Coast, 
St. Lucia will be sending a team. Um, and what was interesting for us is that the battle was here. We also got the opportunity to engage the team from the battle. St. Lucia is sending a team to the games in the Bahamas, which is where the youth games are going to be held. And if you recall, the youth games, St. Lucia withdrew from hosting the youth games because we did not have the means um, to host it. And so St. Lucia will be sending a very strong contingent of 28 to the games in the Bahamas as a signal of our commitment to sport, which is what we, we, we wanted to demonstrate when we agreed to host the games um, some years ago. In terms of youth development and job creation, youth, of course, is our present, and they are pivotal to the development of all sectors in our country. So, Mr. President, in building a new St. Lucia, it requires that we not only create jobs, but we create opportunities for young people that will facilitate them in culturing the work ethic and the mindset required for that new environment that we are creating. Where young people recognize that they have a stake in our country's tomorrow. Where they can dream and live their dreams and not blame others for their failures. Where they can work and stick and work with, sorry, where they can work with the stick to itiveness that a Laverne Spencer displays. And you know, every time Laverne goes out, we all are excited because we know something good will happen for our country. That's how some of us live, of the good things that happen in our society. And so she continues to radiate that for us. Where our young people, we would want to know that our young people are as respectful and determined and charismatic as a Darren Sammy, who is a genuine champion who understands competition, who knows what it is to face the opposition and go out there and beat them up. That's what we have to teach our young people to do. Face them, beat them, look them in the eye and beat them. We need to be able to do that. We need men who can stand up and do that. And Darren Sammy can attest to that. He knows what it is to be a real champion. Where we have young people who are composed and humble and grateful as a Johnson Charles where they are as resilient as a Boo Hinson who has stood the test of time with his music, where they are adaptive as a Timothy Polio, where they know how to frustrate those who are trying to frustrate them like the father of this nation, Sir John did, and where they can chant like Ashanti as they go about their daily chores. That's the type of young people that we want to have in our society. In this regard, Mr. President, we are revisiting the early childhood education curriculum to make it more relevant to building and sustaining a new St. Lucia. We have also included citizenship and soft skills training in the school's curriculum so that we are better able to churn up young people who are ready for the world of work as entrepreneurs and employers and not only as employees. Our social cluster of ministries is paying close attention to our youth at risk within and without the school setting. The program offerings in the coming year will include all those that will allow for exploration of self and new areas of endeavor by young people. The Youth Empowerment Program, the NAPS Program, the After School Programs, the National Skills Development Center will all work with our strategic partners to ensure that our young people are ready and certified for the world of work. Mr. President, further with respect to job creation, we have passed legislation that facilitates the ease of doing business by major corporations. We are fine-tuning legislation with regards to facilitating our small businesses. We remain committed to the apprenticeship program, which provides a measure of support to local businesses that wish to contribute to job creation. We are working to establish the pool of the Caribbean project. We have designed, we have signed agreements for two major call centers in artificial intelligence. And even while we speak, we have a number of construction projects to be implemented across the country. Mr. President, we are determined to assist our young people, to enable them to move from a state of dependence to one of independence as young adults in our society. Mr. President, fixing this broken country is a challenge. It's, it's a challenge that requires us to push ourselves outside the box, to explore the unknown and create the results that we want and we can do it. We have the capacity as a people to do it. We have an amazing team in here. Our team has persons who worked under the tutelage 
of the great Sir John George Melvin Compton, the father of this nation. Sir John taught us how to love our country, how to achieve, how to, how to make that difference. So we are ready. Our team is ready. I am ready. And the environment is now right for us to take off. I particularly want to thank the staff of the various agencies, the CDF, the Folk Research Center, the, the, the Department of Local Government, who continue to display a great level of professionalism in the delivery of their services to our country. I hope that over the next year, we can increase the level of efficiency so that our citizens can feel the positive vibrations. Because it's one thing for the politicians to be articulating and talking, but it's another thing for those persons who have the responsibility to execute, to actually go out and make it happen. And so we're hoping that over the next year, we can see a lot more of that and we can feel the positive vibrations and be proud as we can chant and we can chant the words of our Nobel laureate, Derek Walcott, saying, Moi c'est Jean Setlissi, c'est là moi sorti, is there I was born. I therefore want to reiterate my support for this budget and thank you, Mr. President, for your indulgence. Minister in the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, Physical Planning, Natural Resources, and Cooperatives. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I rise in support of this 2017-2018 budget presentation by my government. Mr. President, Mr. President, I am honored and humbled to make my maiden budget presentation in this honorable chamber. I wish to first thank Mr. President, um, Mr. President the Almighty for the opportunity to be here. I also wish to thank the many supporters of the United Workers Party who placed their trust in me in the two weeks leading up to the June 6 general election. Mr. President, I also would like to take the opportunity to thank the Prime Minister for affording me this opportunity in his cabinet. To my many friends and family members who stood every day by me, for the two weeks, I say thank you. Mr. President, since the election, the star boy of the Labour Party is no more. No more minister's account. That scandalous minister's account. I would also like to say, Mr. President, thank you to the Department of Physical Planning for the support for the past year. Mr. President, through the grace of God, the people of this country spoke on June 6, 2000, 2016, with confidence, purpose, passion, and quiet resolve. Mr. President, I am humbled to be part of a great team of men and women who remain committed, passionate, and charged with timeless energy to, the, to transform this beautiful country of ours and to harness its vast human potential for the benefit of mankind. This team of ours, Mr. President, is a team, a government that is at its core, at its very core, that is endowed with the DNA of service to people for a people-centered approach to development and good governance. Mr. President, a group of individuals listening to the concerns of the people of this country and act on it. A group of individuals, Mr. President, with empathy, healing, and awareness, 
and conceptualization. As a government, we seek to nurture the abilities of the nation to dream great dreams for the benefit of the people. We have the foresight to understand the lessons from the past, the realities of the present, and the likely consequences of decisions for the future. We are a government, Mr. President, of stewardship. Peter Block, the American author, consultant, and speaker in the areas of organizational development, community building, and civic engagement, has defined stewardship as holding something in trust for the greater good of society. Those who were pre previously trusted to lead this country failed miserably in the performance of their duties, and hence, Mr. President, the United Workers' Party was voted back in office to, to provide true vision, leadership, and positive direction to this country of ours. We, Mr. President, are building a new St. Lucia. Mr. President, this government is committed to, to the growth of people and is passionate about the development and building of communities. As a servant of the people, we believe that people have an intrinsic value beyond their tangible contributions as workers. Mr. President, we believe our people deserve more than step to take nice things, to take, to make nice things for them. Such an approach to governance is short-sighted at best and devoid of vision at worst. Mr. President, our task as a responsible government is to nurture the astonishing potential of our people to achieve extraordinary um, outcomes as we endeavor to move this country to a path of growth and progress. Mr. President, I reiterate, we are building a new St. Lucia. Mr. President, as a people-centered government, we are committed to a great vision guided by strategic development plan led by our visionary prime minister, dedicated to effective financial and prudent financial management. Also, Mr. President, a fo uh, focused on human potential, development to provide transparent and accountable outcomes and results to move this country, to move this country forward. Mr. President, the legendary management theorist and practitioner, Peter Ferdinand Drucker, reminds us that management is doing nothing right, but leadership is doing the right things. Mr. President, doing the right things requires boldness and innovation. It is about communication, the vision and message, as well as the tough decisions as, as the increases needed to raise monies to fix the roads. Mr. President, the task ahead of us is reforming this country and putting it on the right trajectory is a mammoth one. But we are un undeterred and we remain steadfast and resolute. We are building a new St. Lucia. We need to get the right skill sets in the right places with the right attitudes to build capacity based on talent, giftings, and emotional intelligence. We are building, Mr. Speaker, a new St. Lucia. Mr. President, that is a part of what the Prime Minister was speaking to when he spoke about the education revolution on page 23 of his budget address. Mr. President, we are getting on with the people's business of rescuing St. Lucia and putting this country back on track. Mr. President, what the members opposite did not expect from us is that we have the courage, the tenacity, drive, and passion to do what must be done to move this country forward. Mr. President, we, are, we have a leader who is not thin-skinned. He is designed and engineered to take the blues, most times unnecessarily, because he believes in the potential and capacity of this country 
and which is beyond the, stre the stretch and the elasticity of our normal limitations to achieve extraordinary outcomes through faith, hard work, dedication, innovation, and people's participation. Mr. President, our leader is fearless, bold, daring, not because he is afraid, he is unafraid, but because he does not let the fear of what could happen make nothing happen. And that is, Mr. President, why he goes the way, because he knows the way and naturally shows the way. Mr. President, this year's budget is designed to grow and build a new and greater St. Lucia. The Honorable Prime Minister has articulated a budget premise, premise on a courageous, determined, and far-sighted program. Mr. President, on page 11 of the budget, the Prime Minister outlined the strategic areas of focus that will be aggressively and progressively pursued over the next four years with the underlying aim of achieving sustainable and inclusive growth. These areas outlined are as follows, Mr. President. Creating sustainable devel um, employment, re-engineering social services, improving security and justice, building capacity in renewable resources, adapting to climate change, and, Mr. President, reforming government to make it more responsive to the business, community, and citizens. On that note, Mr. President, this is a clear reminder that the fundamental plank of democracy is based on the government for the people, of the people, and by the people. We, the members of the United Workers' Party, are building a new St. Lucia. Mr. President, permit me a few minutes in order to deal with some household matters which needs to be dealt with before mo moving on to the substance of my very first budget presentation. Mr. President, I have observed the Labour Party in government from 97 and their propensity to increase the debt unsustainably. I come to the conclusion that this type of government under Labour Party policies would not and still are not right for this country. Mr. President, the Labour Party management of the affairs of this country was not good as it, as, at its best. The people of this country deserve better, and so they voted them out of office once again in 2016. Mr. President, the parliamentary representative for Denry North in his budget contribution for 2017-2018, he made mention of many issues which I believe needs to be addressed. Mr. Speaker, I again seek some latitude to answer some of these burning issues. First and foremost, Mr. Speaker, the representative insinuated, Mr. Speaker, that I portray myself as the parliamentary representative of the constituency through my activities throughout the constituency. Mr. President, I have a passion for this particular community, this constituency, the Denry North constituency. I have spent majority of my life in that particular constituency. Actually, Mr. Speaker, I was raised in the community of Grand Riviere, part of the Denry North. Mr. President, I am, pres I am presently in a strategic position to assist persons within the different communities in that constituency. Mr. President, do you believe that it is fair or even right for someone to seek my assistance and I should turn them away? Mr. President, this is my nature to help and assist people. Every time this thing happens, I remember my mother clearly saying, I'm not going to have anything. Why? Because every time someone comes to me and says, um, could, I, um, could you help me out with this? Could you help me out with that? I am there. I try my best to assist 
in whatever way I can. Mr. President, why ask persons who require assistance to travel all the way to Castries to see me when I could speak with them right there in the valley? I remember constituents crying out, going to constituency office, spending hours, hours, Mr. President. Lo and behold, they, not, they can't speak to the parliamentary representative. This is not me. This is not in my nature, Mr. President. Mr. President, a number of us tend to forget that the constituents are the ones important in this equation of politics. We have the tendency to forget that we are the ones who assist, they are the ones who assist us in getting our salaries. What's so wrong in spending some time with them? I'm not going to stop hanging out around the nook and crannies of the valley. I'm not going to stop socializing with persons throughout the various communities. I will continue to lend a listening ear to everyone whether it be red, yellow, black, green, blue, whichever, I am going to be there. Mr. President, the parliamentary representative, again, stood idly by. I could remember this thing clearly like it was yesterday. And did nothing while people outside of the community were employed. And not a single soul from the Tilarishus area was able to eat a bread. Mr. President, the parliamentary representative could not have at least engaged the contractor and pleaded for him to employ a few young men from the, um, that particular community. These residents stood there every day watching work being done, and they did not gain a cent from it. Is that fair? Is that right? That is the kind of poor representation, Mr. Speaker. Insensitivity, I don't care attitude. Mr. President, this is, that's what's being displayed by the parliamentary representative for this particular constituency. Last year, Mr. President, I was attending the swearing ceremony of the Dairy North constituents, Dairy North and South constituency councils seated at the, head, at the head table in my capacity as a cabinet minister. And the MP for the, for the Denry North constituency nearly got a heart attack. Why, you may ask, Mr. Speaker? Why? It appears that this, um, um, this, it appears to me that this gentleman is so threatened by me that he can sit at the head table with me. Mr. President, the wonderful people of the valley will continue to invite me to community functions, and I will continue to make myself available whenever I can. By the way, the current senator from Denry South, Mr. President, was at a sword turning ceremony on the Denry playing field last year, as a matter of fact, and reviews of tapes, particularly at football competitions. You can see him following the then minister very closely like a close protection officer or bodyguard prior to elections. Nothing for that? Mr. President, it appears that the rep is more informed of the matters that happens in cabinet, apparently. It appears that he spends more time there than I do, despite the fact that 95% of the times I am there. And when I'm not there, Mr. S Mr. President, I am being told what happens. Mr. President, the member neglected to mention in his presentation that the school assistance program and also the step included supporters of both sides of the political divide. He never mentioned that his supporters are still em employed in the elderly care program and are even serving as supervisors because we are concerned with capacity and not party. We are a responsible government a caring government, a government that is inclusive, whether you are red, again, once I, I will repeat, whether you are red, you are yellow, green, blue, whichever color. Mr. President, 
nothing, some, nothing substantial was done for our farming, farmers in the constituency. The farm roads are now being rehabilitated thanks to the Minister of Agriculture. Mr. President, a number of farmers are back on their farms because, our faith, because of our faith in the farmers in the country. We have carefully and deliberate, and we have careful and deliberate policies to ensure the, that farmers can earn a living. Mr. President, the Labour Party killed the agriculture, killed agriculture, and made the farmers of this country suffer. Our government, the government of the United Workers Party, will continue to work hard to make farming a respectable way of living in this country. Mr. President, this government has distributed more fertilizer to more farmers than ever before on, on both sides of the political divide. It is not about politics. Farmers are the backbone of this economy, and we will support all farmers, whether from the Salvation Committee, whether they coupe or pas coupe. We are not about playing politics, as we are focused on getting the farmers back on the farms and to produce for this nation. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, sorry. Denry North is a farming community. Very little in the last four years, very little, Mr. Speaker, was done for agriculture to sustain any kind of agriculture in this particular constituency. And mind you, there was a representative there was a representative in cabinet, elected representative, that is. I believe, I believe, Mr. S Mr. President, that when it investment is made by any government, by any government in agriculture, what happens is that no one, especially, especially in the Denwin of Basin, Persons are involved in agriculture. They don't depend on any government. Why? Because they have, most likely, they have a salary coming in every week, every fortnight. They're not going to come to any politician to ask for a tea canal or anything of that sort. Why? Because they have monies coming into their pockets every time. I want to extend on this, Mr. President, by saying that I personally believe in the areas Eras of um, the deceased Prime Minister, former Prime Minister, Sir John Compton, the last 30 years, the country was not dependent and persons were not dependent on government. Why? One of the main reasons, I believe, is that they were not dependent on any government because every week they could have gone down to castries of few fort. Every week, every Friday, and they had monies in their pocket. So they were not bothered with what was happening in the country because they had monies in, the, in their pocket. They had monies in their pockets every week or every two weeks. I want to move on to some youth matters, Mr. President. On page 22 of the budget address, Mr. President, the Honorable Prime Minister, under the section Reengineering Social Services, spoke to a more equitable and just society. He went further to say that all sections of our population, particularly the, particularly the most vulnerable, must have access to systems that provide support and services. Mr. President, the realism of recognizing and acknowledging the importance of the social dimension of economic development is critical as we build a society that is proactive and embraces risk is uh, in a positive way. As the Prime Minister explained, Mr. President, this new society of ours must be anchored on pillars of the individual, the family, the community. Mr. President, there is a clear recognition that sustainable economic development cannot be achieved unless, the, unless and until social development also takes place. Consequently, the social dimensions of economic development and productivity 
are as important as the economic dimensions. And so, Mr. President, our Prime Minister is right on target when he stated on page 22 of his address that our social service, services regime must be reoriented. Mr. President, our empowered youth stands the chance of succeeding in this society, unlike those who lack such opportunities. Empowerment can be carried out by, carried out by self or sponsored. Be it sponsored or self-empowered, support is very important as it, is at, as it beautifies the youth and the country as at, at large. Mr. President, I now move on to my department, the Department of Physical Planning. Mr. President, under policy, planning, and administrative services within the capital expenditure, there is an amount of $198,435 for the expansion of the union storage facility. The Department of Physical Planning, Mr. President, currently has two metal containers at, a, at Union, which are utilized for the document storage. As the cash of documents increases, additional space is needed to create both off-site and in-house to accommodate new documents. Given the nature of the services being provided, particularly by, particularly by the Department of Physical Planning, Mr. President, documents are received daily on an average of 1,100 applications, applications in paper format annually for the process. These applications are bulk, as they include large copies of construction drawings and other types of plans. It is not uncommon, Mr. Mr. President, for technical staff to have to retrieve files that have been archived to assist with the assessment of new proposals. It is against this backdrop that this government has agreed to expand and upgrade the existing union storage facility, while consideration is being given to establish a secure digital storage platform for the ministry's documents. This project, Mr. President, is expected to meet the department's storage needs in the medium to long term, reduce document retrieval time, improve security of documents, and also allow for more comfortable staff accommodation within the various sectors of the department. Mr. President, all pre-construction activities. Approval is expected to be completed. All pre-construction activities, sorry, Mr. President, that is preparation of designs and bills of quantities, electrical and structural certification, development control authority, Mr. President. Approval is expected to be completed by September. Construction by this, the end of construction by December and facility fully operational by January of 2018. Mr. President, in looking at the computerization of the land registry, and we all know all the issues faced at the land registry for the past, for the past year, Mr. President, working half day for a, lo a long time now, Mr. President. I'm happy to report, Mr. President, that they back on track working the entire day. The land registry and automation of databases of land, lands with a, an allocation, Mr. President, of $193,620. The land registry is a service-oriented section. It plays a critical role in the economic development of the state. It is the high traffic section since many transactions are dependent on the efficient operations of the section. All segments and sectors of society, including the ministry itself, relies on the, produ on the product provided by this section. As a result of the foregoing, it is critical that 
the digitization initiative is completed and the section be equipped with competent and knowledgeable staff members. A number of challenges, Mr. Mr. President. Unmotivated members of staff and high absenteeism due to poor working condition. Security concerns, Mr. President, have created a, security concerns have created some security concerns have created some alarm for um, for employees. A lack of surveillance footage in the office in the office of the Registrar of Lands defeats the purpose for which it was intended. Mr. President, the staff transfers or Staff transfers of experienced and knowledgeable staff members have left a brain drain within the section. This will be addressed. Seeking to adhere, Mr. President, to the laws sometimes conflicts with the administrative depart demands of this ministry. Mr. President, a review and amendment of the Land Registry Act, which provides, which gives effect to the current processes of the section is currently being undertaken. Front desk computer is a problem. The progress of the computerization initiative is quite slow due to the technical and operational issues. This initiative has been in effect for over eight years now, Mr. President. The computerization initiative is intended to be undertaken in a two-phase two -phase process. Currently, the land registry, Mr. President, is still operating within the first phase. However, a timeline of one year was given to ensure its completion so that the benefits of the project through the implementation of phase two can be realized. Honorable Minister, you have 15 minutes in which to complete your presentation. Yes. Thank you, sir. Mr. President, the manner in which they seek to undertake this project was briefly explored during previous informal discussions with the company. The company has a critical uh, technical project coordinator who previously held the position of registrar of lands. This, tactical ex this technical expertise and knowledge of the land registry makes this company a competent option to pursue in, foregoing the, in going forward regarding this automation initiative. Further, Mr. President, meetings with this company will determine whether they will be the best option to complete this initiative, given the need for the automation to, the com to be completed within the time expressed above and avoid the extensive delay which has persisted over the years in completing only the first phase of the project. Mr. President, Based on a review of the aforementioned pieces of legislation, sorry, in order to provide the legislation proposals by the various sections of the Department of Physical Planning, Mr. President, the following pieces of legislation were examined. The Crown Lands Act, the Land Surveyors Act, the Physical Planning and Development Act, and the Leg Land Registry Act. Based on a review of the aforementioned pieces of legislation, the overriding broad policy objective is the need to revise archaic acts and strengthen existing legislation in order to improve efficacy and compliance with the said acts. The Land Registry, I would like to touch on, the Land Registry Act, I would like to touch on, Mr. President. The bill is intended to incorporate great, greater access to the, public, to the public regarding land registry information. Also, Mr. President, simplify some of the land registry procedures and make it more adaptable to modern day life. Preparing the computerization of the land registry records, assisting in the ease of doing business also. Mr. President, the land acquisition budget has been increased to $14 million, while it, has, 
while it has been increased, it does not begin to address the issues faced at the department with regards to the acquisition of land for compensation. Finally, Mr. President, there is no doubt in my mind that our country is moving in the right direction. I have full confidence in my leader in taking our country. Again, I have full confidence in my leader in taking our country out of the mess which we inherited from the Labour Party. And I have no doubt, again, I have no doubt that our beautiful island will be back on track once again. I thank God for being here, and I want to join my other colleagues in supporting the appropriations bill for this financial year. I thank you. Minister for Health. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Fellow St. Lucians who are still with us today, especially mm -hmm. residents of Castro South, mm -hmm. guests of this honorable Senate, good afternoon. Media personnel, bonjour. Fellow senators, it is wonderful to be here with you once again to conduct government business. Special good afternoon to you, Mr. President. It surely has been a long day for us. Usually we're out of here by now. I wish to, of course, wish all public workers a very happy Public Service Day, as we all look forward to a very exciting and bright year ahead. It is indeed sad today that our opposition senators are not here. Of course, I have grown used to at least having somebody on the other side to oppose, if not just for opposing sake, at least in the name of representation. Nevertheless, the work of this country, our downtrodden country, must continue, and every effort must be made to regain our prominence in the region and the world, and to bring some sense of civility and national pride back to our people in St. Lucia. I want to take this opportunity, Mr. President, to thank all the doctors and nurses who work tirelessly in our healthcare institutions taking care of our sick families, relatives, and friends. I truly appreciate the care that they provide day after day under extenuating circumstances. And to them, I say thank you for serving so well. I wish to thank the staff of the ministry, whom, upon becoming Minister of Health and Wellness, they welcomed me to the ministry, and they have continued to assist me to carry out the mandate of our healthcare sector. To my fellow cabinet colleagues, I want to say that it has been truly an honor to serve with such a special group of people. The experience has made me more tolerant, mm -hmm. more understanding, and a better person, all in all. Our Prime Minister, and of course we have heard much about him today, but that is because in our heart of hearts we understand what it is that we, the people of St. Lucia, have put this Prime Minister through. Mm. Mr. President, my heart goes out to our Prime Minister, to his family, the First Lady, and to both of these families, I say, you cannot begin to imagine or understand 
the warmth, the love, and the caring that comes from these two families. I do not know, Mr. President, if you are aware that we have merged. We have merged two of the most prominent, most conscientious, most decent and honest and most giving families we have in St. Lucia, in the First Lady and our Prime Minister. These two families, Mr. President, it's not only that they have means, but they share those means with the entire community. They have given, they give, and they continue to give to the people of St. Lucia. Mr. President, I, I started by asking if you are aware that Mr. Dunstan Diboli, our First Lady's father, he served as minister for a, for a term, for a government term. And during his service, he never took a salary from government. He never took a salary from the government of St. Lucia. He served without getting paid. And this is how good this family has been to our country, St. Lucia. So when we hear people making derogatory remarks and trying to take down any of these two families, we as St. Lucians, as pride citizens of this country, ought not to tolerate it. It is a disgrace. So our Prime Minister, he is truly a rare gem in this society. Where in the world in this day and age you find a man with such vision, with wisdom, foresight, and insight? Where? I want to say here today, this is a man of pure substance. Look at his posture, Mr. President. Fearless. Yeah. And you've heard it here today. He goes where no one else wants to go, without security and without fear. There is no nook or cranny in St. Lucia that our Prime Minister fears to tread. That is a leader, true leadership. And I want to place on record here today that among all the Prime Ministers that I see in the region, our Prime Minister stands at the top and is the best Prime Minister in the entire Caribbean. I thank our Prime Minister for allowing me this opportunity to serve my country at a level where I can make a difference. So it is with wholeheartedness that I stand in this honorable house to fully support the Appropriation Bill 2017-2018. Mr. President, I believe more has been said here than I can ever say today. We at the ministry responsible for our nation's health and wellness recognize that our population has aged at a much, much faster rate than our level of development in this country. Over the past two decades, we have seen sustained high life expectancy at birth and people living much longer than they used to before. We believe that this is driven by a reduction in communicable diseases as major causes of death and illness, diseases such as HIV and AIDS, yellow fever, sexually transmitted diseases, these diseases are more or less under control now. And what we are seeing is a reduction of these diseases in our society. I want to pause here to say, when we speak about HIV and AIDS, we tend to target a certain group of persons. And I want to, I want to beg you today to consider the fact that any one of us can be struck 
with these illnesses that we tend to target certain groups of having. I, I do not want to lead you in a vacuum here. So I'm going to say, when we speak of HIV and AIDS, we tend to target a certain group of persons. And we ought to develop a higher level of tolerance in our society for all people of all colors and all ages. We also believe that is as a result of a steady reduction in fertility. We have seen women today postponing childbearing until a much later age. And a lot of women in our society are only having one child per family, as opposed to four per family about 20 years ago. So all of this has resulted in the healthcare system having to change its modus operandi. We now have to refocus our priorities. Um, that has impacted on our demographics. And that is also mirrored by our epidemiological changes. So the emergence of chronic non-communicable diseases has taken over the cause of death, which used to be communicable diseases. We also have the increase in premature deaths due to violence and injury. As a result of these due changes, Mr. President, we must urgently shift and re-engineer the way that we look at life and healthcare. We have to look at, place a greater focus on healthy aging, as well as a better quality of life throughout the life cycle. We must provide the best maternal and child healthcare for the fewer babies that are being born and I want to report here today that the ministry has successfully eliminated um, the mother-to-child transmission of HIV and AIDS in St. Lucia. That is, that is quite an accomplishment because we are one of the few countries in the world that has been able to do that. We also must eliminate the risk, of, the risk factors for hypertension, diabetes, cancers, and other NCDs to improve quality of life. NCDs are the main causes of death and morbidity in St. Lucia, and by NCDs I mean non-communicable diseases such as cancer, diabetes, and so on and so forth. In 2014, NCDs contributed to 81% of total deaths compared to 71% in 2008. So these NCDs are the leading causes of death in St. Lucia today that is cancer, heart disease, strokes, diabetes. But this year, Mr. Speaker, this year marks the 10th year that the CARICOM heads of government promised to unite to stop the epidemic of chronic non-communicable diseases. So we are, of course, focusing on reducing smoking of tobacco in public places, and there is a draft legislation that speaks to that, that is currently with the AG. We also are looking at unhealthy diets, lack of exercise, and other risk factors that contribute to the development of NCDs. We have recognized though that we need a multi-sectoral, holistic society approach in order to challenge the rising impact of NCDs in our population, and as a result, the following policy decisions have commenced and will be fulfilled in the coming financial year. We will re-establish the National Multi-Sectoral NCD Commission. Of course, I have already mentioned the legislation and regulations to engender tobacco smoke-free public places, which is currently in draft form. We will promote healthy foods and increase physical activity in schools by engaging the relevant stakeholders we particularly want to target food items such as um, soft drinks in the schools because while we are complaining that in the school cafeterias we have soft drinks in some school cafeterias, even when we look at removing those soft drinks in the cafeterias, 
In a lot of schools, we have the vendors right outside of the school selling those very same drinks that we are asking to be eliminated from the school cafeteria. So what you're really doing is you're asking the school child to get out of the school and go right outside and get one of those soft drinks, which is really unhealthy for them. So we have to look at strategies um, so that we can remove these kinds of unhealthy foods on the school premises, in the school as well as on the school premises. And you know, we are saying we need a holistic approach because we do not want to try and do this. And then you hear, as soon as they ask the vendors to move away from the school, that everybody starts saying how they are making a little leaving and they have to make a bread and this and that. Because at the end of the day, if we do not do that, it is costing the country a lot more money to take care of the resulting illnesses that will occur later down the road. And these very same people who are saying that they have to make a bread and so on, they themselves are doing more harm than good to the people whom they are providing these soft drinks to. So we are going to take a very proactive approach in terms of getting rid of these unhealthy foods out of the schools. And I want to applaud the mayor of Castries for clearing all around the Ave Maria and the RC boys and so on, because that really was an eyesore and a real health hazard for the children that attend, attend those two schools. Mr. President, we also must detect and control from the onset new and emerging, re-emerging communicable diseases, whether they originate within this country or outside. Illnesses such as Zika, chikungunya, yellow fever, we have to be able to detect these diseases before they really affect or impact our, our population. We must also reduce the premature deaths and illnesses due to violence and injury. Our entire country can relate to the loss of lives due to violence and injury. Mr. President, deaths due to the illegal drug trade, gang violence, vehicular accidents, economic strangulation, and these things continue to wreak havoc among our people, particularly among the youth. Our population must understand, Mr. President, that any activity that has the potential to cut down on one's life is not a viable option. Our people must learn to work hard to afford their needs and to take pride in doing so. And we have heard the Minister of Culture speak on those issues. Bringing back the pride in our people. It is not worth making a quick buck at the cost of losing one's life, Mr. President. Our people must understand what God intended when he gave us the commandment, thou shalt not kill. Killing someone is not a solution. Because after the person is dead, the reason why the person was killed in the first place continues to exist. We kill each other, and that does not solve the problem. It does not bring comfort to anyone. So we have to, we have to just stop that sort of scourge in our society. It is putting a lot of pressure on the healthcare system, because some people, in those kinds of violent acts, they end up just being deformed, they spend lots of time in our hospital that is an, already under pressure, and a lot of them do not have the care that they need when they go home, they, re, they repeat visits. So it is putting a lot of pressure on our healthcare system. You had an ambulance all the time, and where is it going? To the, to the hospital. So we really need to curb those activities in our society. I can understand that at the root of it all may well be socioeconomic conditions, because a lot of people complain that it is because people do not have work, people have no jobs, therefore they engage in negative activity. I understand they have to survive, and I know that this government is putting every emphasis on making job creation a priority. So when they tell you about preserving your patrimony, for those 30% or so who are unemployed, ask them, who exactly will enjoy that patrimony after somebody gets cut down in a violent act? Who is going to enjoy that patrimony? The dead man's children? The mother who has died, her children will enjoy that patrimony? That patrimony dies with that person. 
They take it to the grave with them. They have left nothing for their children. A lot of these people who are involved in those violent acts, they have nothing. And they leave nothing for these children. So what is there about protecting a patrimony that you don't have to begin with? Those of us who have it, we can talk about it, but we already have it. These people who really need it are the ones that are getting killed on our streets. And their children are left behind. These children don't enjoy that. These people go to their graves and it turns to dust, just like them, that patrimony we're talking about. So let us create jobs for our people first, and then these people will be empowered to look after their patrimony. Mr. President, this is certainly not what our citizens in this country want. For us to be protecting patrimony while they go hungry, while they do not know where the next meal is coming from. They do not have money to buy shoes to put on the feet of their children to go to school. $500 to every child that passes the common entrance. How long is that going to last? By the time you buy uniforms, shoes, books, where is it going? For the rest of the term, you have to provide transportation, bus fare. You have to provide food and you have to provide clothing for other activities. Let us not be fooled. Yes, we have a patrimony to protect. But first of all, we have to protect human life. We have to provide jobs for these people. And that is what is important. And I have heard the opposition preaching for no peace in our land. There will be no peace. They said there will be no investors, and there are investors. Now they are calling for no peace. Are they inciting violence in our society? Question. Remember when they called the Ouj? The blood has not stopped spilling on our streets. Now they call in victimization. And then, of course, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Every day you heard victimization, victimization. But they were able to tell us the percentage of workers employed on the NICE were Labour Party workers, Labour Party supporters. So who is victimizing? Be careful what you ask for. You just might get it. They are also promising to carry out their mischief by any means necessary. Well, for as sure as I know that Jesus Christ is the Alpha and he is the Omega, That's right. when my government decides and the people of St. Lucia decide that DSH is going to go on, it is going to go on. Make no bones about it. It is not the Labour Party that decides what happens with DSH. It is the government of the day and the people of St. Lucia. So, Mr. President, our healthcare policy direction is to promote and facilitate preventative care and provide good quality, affordable health care for all St. Lucians. Not just those that work and they can afford it, but for all St. Lucians. As such, the ministry has designed a health system strengthening project that aims to increase access to essential services, reduce the inequality that exists in terms of accessing health care, and preventing the poor health outcomes that we currently experience in our health care system. This project will also address the dependency on our out-of-pocket expenditures. As you know, you always see people with little sheets of paper, with sometimes with pictures on it of people who need health care, and they ask you for a donation. The people have to go to Martinique and so on and so forth, and they cannot afford it. So this program is going to take care of all of that. This is the program that's going to speak to universal health care. So a national insurance plan is going to be set up of course, we are still sourcing the funding, and this is why we did, it, we did not roll it out in this current budget. But 
throughout this year, we are going to continue to source the funds to roll out that program, most likely in the next budget, in the upcoming budget. So I want to say to you that there is hope. There is hope for those people who cannot afford health care right now, who have to come to the ministry on a daily basis. We see them coming to ask for health assistance, and we only have a limited amount of funds that we can use to assist these people. With a national health insurance plan, everyone is going to be able to access health care, not just a select few. The main components of that program, Mr. President, include governance, services, financing and coverage, human resources, health infrastructure, quality and health information systems. And that is the policy direction, Mr. President. That is the, direct, the policy that's going to guide us in the commissioning of the OKEU as well as the St. Jude Hospital. Mr. President, we have heard a lot of hoopla about the OKEU as well as St. Jude Hospital. And I want to give you a scenario that actually happened in April of this year, just to show you the status of the hospital, where it is at. Because we have heard that the workers were ready to go to this hospital. We have heard that it is there, it is waiting to be opened, and it is not opening. So I just want to demonstrate to you where this hospital opening is at. On the 11th of April, Mr. President, I got a call from a desperate mother. Her grandchild was dying. Well, she felt the child was dying. The mother was too distraught to talk to me. And what the grandmother said to me was that there are no ventilators at the Victoria Hospital, and the child needs to be placed on a ventilator. So, Mr. President, I immediately contacted my acting prime minister, and we took a decision that whatever needs to be done to save the baby, I should put in place. Mr. President, we immediately asked the technical people to go to OKEU, the new hospital, and get the OKEU had free ventilators idle. So we immediately asked them to get one of the ventilators to take to the Victoria Hospital so that the baby could be placed on that ventilator. Mr. President, the ventilator was taken to the Victoria Hospital. But on arrival there, we were told that none of the staff who has been who we have heard were trained and were ready to move into the OKEU hospital. None of the staff were able to operate that ventilator. None of the doctors there at the time was able to hook it up. And the technical people did not know how to hook up that ventilator. Mr. President, this is not high science we're talking about. A ventilator is something you can just put the model and the brand on the internet, and you will get a demonstration on how to hook it up. And we were not able to get the ventilator hooked up. The call came, Mr. President, around 7.19 p.m. on that day. And the parents were very encouraged when I informed them that we are going to take the ventilator from OKEU and send it to Victoria Hospital so that the baby could be placed on the ventilator. But then, Around 11 o'clock that night, a very distraught grandmother with a lot of crying in the background called me and informed me that the baby had passed because the people at Victoria Hospital were not able to get that ventilator going so that the baby could be hooked up to the ventilator and that would have saved the baby's life, Mr. President. Now, Mr. President, when I became Minister of Health, um, I was told that the hospital was ready. The staff were trained and everything was ready. What was not ready was during the following months was being put in place. So I say this to you to give you an idea 
of what we are faced with with this hospital. And then you can take it from there. Mr. President, I have stopped giving opening dates for this hospital because I am not a technical person. I am not a public servant. And from what I see on the ground, we are going to have to make a real desperate and concerted effort to open the OKEU sooner rather than later. Because as we speak, we have St. Lucians who are dying because they do not have access to a lot of the equipment that now sits idle in that OKEU. I believe, Mr. President, many of our people who were involved in that project, they have failed so many St. Lucians who have passed as a result of not having access. We as a people, Mr. President, we must have a conscience. It cannot only be about making money. I am going to move on, Mr. President. Of course, the new, and you know, we hear the opposition sitting and giving us advice on what to do. We didn't do it, so why don't you all do it? Hmm. Open the hospital, why don't you all open it? It's as if, Mr. President, we have a case of Rip Van Wrinkle. They went to sleep for the past 15 years, and all of a sudden, they woke up, yeah. realizing that the United Workers' Party is in power. Mm. <laughs> and all the ideas and the things they dreamt of now, they want to implement, but it is too late, because they slept for too long. Rip Van Wrinkle, Mr. President, we have a former prime minister that operates as Rip Van Wrinkle. Now, Mr. President, he's crawling in all kinds of little holes in Viewfort, talking to all kinds of mischief makers to come out and create mischief. But the people of St. Lucia are awake. That's right. And God is watching. Baby X did not die in vain. We are going to open OKEU, but it's going to take a lot. The Ministry of Health and Wellness, Mr. President, focuses on primary or community care services. These are those services that are located within a three mile radius, like the health centers and so on. We have 32 wellness centers to operate, two district hospitals, Sufre Denry and Grosile Polyclinic. We provide tertiary secondary care programs, and these focus on acute health conditions which require inpatient, emergency, or specialized services, such as lab services, general surgery, and outpatient care. Honorable Minister, you have 15 minutes left in which to complete your presentation. Mr. President, I would like to invoke Section 35, to allow the Honorable Senator to an additional, how many? 30? An additional 30 minutes. Senators, the question is that standing order 45 free be invoked to allow the minister an additional 14 minutes in which to complete her presentation. I now put a question in as many as are of that opinion, say I. Aye. As many as are of a contrary opinion, you know. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Minister, you have an additional 40 minutes. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, colleagues. I'm going to do this quickly because the time seems to have flown by. Mr. President, our, we have um, public health programs which involves monitoring. This is where we have the septic sewage systems and so on. When people have problems, they call us and we have a lot of these problems, Mr. President. We have Port Health Surveillance, which is an intervention aimed at strengthening health security to reduce health risks associated with international travel and trade. This is where we have our workers go, to the, go on the cruise ships and uh, make sure that everything is okay. We have the Food Safety Program, which seeks to reduce the risk of foodborne illnesses and exposure to unwholesome foods, which usually um, takes place in the restaurants and food areas. The workers go in there and make sure that the food is wholesome. And we have a water and wastewater management program, which addresses issues pertaining to the quality of water used for domestic and recreational purposes. 
Mr. President, this year we have um, capital projects, um, accelerated health system project. We have a national health management information system project. We will be purchasing medical equipment for St. Jude's Hospital. We will be purchasing six additional renal dialysis machines to complement what already exists at St. Jude's Hospital. Um, currently, we have 36 patients on dialysis at St. Jude, and we have 27 on the waiting list. So you can well imagine that these machines will be quite um, welcome for St. Jude's patients. Some patients at St. Jude's has to be transported to Victoria Hospital and Tapion to get dialyzed. And, and Mr. President, we are talking about St. Jude's Hospital, the only hospital in the south of the island. That is right smack in the former prime minister's constituency. And he claims to care about the people of St. Lucia. Mr. President, seven years and St. Jude is still not completed. But after two years in office, the Labour Party was demanding that the United Workers' Party administration deliver St. Jude to them completed. Mm. An additional five years later, mm. and this hospital is just about 40% complete. And a lot of the infrastructure will have to be torn down because it, is not, it does not meet the right standard for a hospital. Mm. But they were shouting that we should have delivered that hospital to them. We had already started ordering equipment. That is how close we were to refurbishing the wing that had burned down. And that equipment, Mr. President, stayed in containers. A lot of it disappeared. A lot of it stayed in containers, and it has expired. Expensive equipment. And to this day, they could not open St. Jude Hospital. But we are going to open St. Jude Hospital. Yes. This is a government that care about the people. We care about the people, Mr. President. That breaks my heart that in the former prime minister's constituency, this hospital was allowed to, to, to stay there. And, and after five, seven years, five years in their hands, they still could not have opened the hospital. But the entire world will see why the former prime minister will do whatever necessary to ensure that DSH does not come on stream. Mr. President, he knows that DSH, with DSH, all the people of the South will get jobs. He's afraid of that. He knows that with DSH, the people of the South will understand the oppression that he kept them under. And they will understand why he kept them under that oppression. Because it was deliberate and it was necessary so that they could keep voting him back in power. But you know, Mr. President, with this budget and DSH, this government is going to deliver the people of the South from bondage. Yeah. We are going to deliver them and give them socioeconomic freedom and liberty at last. That is what we are going to give to them. And no amount of anwush chanting will stop that. Yes. Mr. President, there is so much more that I can say. We have a MEG budget this year of $110 million, just about $2.3 million increase. And that only is going to our pharmaceuticals, um, purchasing of pharmaceuticals. So really and truly, the Ministry of Health has not received any much additional budget to carry out all of these activities that we have to carry out. But we have learned that we have to do more with less and we are going to conquer the challenge, Mr. President. We are going to deliver at the Ministry of Health. This is the first time that we are allocating so much to purchasing of medicine because we recognize that our people need the medication for them to survive. So the budget increase of 2.3 million goes towards purchasing of pharmaceuticals. Mr. President, right now, we have 78 persons. We have seven, 69 persons on dialysis at, dialysis at Victoria Hospital. And we have 59 waiting for dialysis. And some of these people, they die waiting, Mr. President. So you see the urgency to open that OKEU 
so that we can, we can have the additional dialysis machines, 11 dialysis machines, to service those other 50-something people that need dialysis. It, it's, it's, it's critical, Mr. President, and that is why my government has made it a priority to open those two hospitals. St. Jude's, we have 36, 10 have passed, and we have um, 26 waiting for dialysis. But that too shall pass, because I want to say to these people, there is hope. Hope is coming. We are not going to allow Alibaba and his band of thieves <laughs> to continue to run this country how they want or to dictate to us how to run it. Mr. President, there is an audit report that we receive, Mr. President. And throughout the report, there is a lot of mismanagement of funds. Every area that they looked at on this report, except for the finance department, you find that there are areas where funds were mismanaged. But you know, the interesting thing for me, Mr. President, is on page, is the audit that was done on the management of traffic tickets. Because you see, Mr. President, I have always had to pay my traffic tickets. And when I saw on that, in that report, that on page 25, Mr. President, when I saw that out of Out of 700, out of 781 traffic tickets, Mr. President, page 21, sorry, 220 tickets were processed. Only 220 tickets were processed, Mr. President. And you probably can relate to that because you, you're in our justice system. Out of 780 tickets issued, a sample of 780 tickets issued, only 20, 220 of those tickets were processed, and 561 tickets remained non-processed. And I'm saying to myself, why did I even bother paying those tickets? There must be a way I could have gone around and, and, and not pay for these tickets. It would seem that some people get away with not paying the tickets in this country. And Mr. President, on page 20, 25, section 2.81, we were informed that in 2014, a project was initiated to deal with warrants issued prior to, prior and up to 2012. The, the initiative involved employing two bailiffs and one financial analyst at a cost of $81 million, $81.7 million. And as of June 2015, over, they were able to collect over $40,000 under this project. However, it cost them $81,000 and, no, it cost them, yes, it cost them $81,000 to employ these people to collect $40,000. In my mind, that is counterproductive, Mr. President. You are paying people $81,000 to collect $40,000. Makes no sense at all. So why is it that we have departments set up, we have police officers issuing tickets, we have a justice system to process those tickets, and we are only collecting, we have to then go and employ additional persons to do the, the job, and at the same time, the monies that we are spending we are spending more to collect those tickets than we are getting. It is all these kinds of things, Mr. President, that our prime minister takes a look at, and he says we are going to stop it. That is why they say he's a stopping prime minister. But there are some things that need to be stopped. They need to be stopped in this country, Mr. President. The donor-funded projects, I wish to take this opportunity, Mr. President, to thank the World Bank for so many projects that they are assisting us with. So I wish to thank them very much for assisting us with these projects. 
I want again to point, to draw your attention to page 65, Mr. President, of that very same report. On page 65, 5.85 of that report, we are told that capital expenditure, including the purchase of a Mercedes-Benz S350 Blue Tech L for £49,528, a private individual donated £33,521 towards the cost, and the High Commission paid the balance of 14000 and something pounds towards the cost of that Mercedes-Benz. 5.86 says, we reiterate that this practice is not in accordance with the regulations because ministries and departments should use the appropriations approved by parliament mm -hmm. to finance their operating expenses. Right. And that has to do with the London mission, Mr. President. Who was there? Who was there? And we know who, you're asking who was there? Yeah. We know who was the high commissioner to London who at the time, Mr. President. And we are hearing of the purchase of a Mercedes-Benz part funding by some private individual. And uh, of course, according to the Finance Act, this is not right. So Mr. President, and there are a lot of these misappropriations of you know, the Finance Act and all kinds of um, things that took place in these missions, Mr. President. I, I want to say that we know who was in charge of the mission at the time. And for the very same reason at the Ministry of Health, I have such high and low, Mr. President, for something to indicate that the dialysis, that the diabetics research center that we were told was promised actually exists. But I have yet to find that. <laughs> there is nothing at the Ministry of Health to indicate that there was ever any anything about a donation of a diabetic center. But yet, the people who are on authority on CIP and the people who are on, a, on authority on St. Lucian passports gave away free diplomatic passports and we got nothing in return. But now all they are doing, all they are doing they are complaining about CIP and what we are getting and what's enough and what's not enough. At least if you sold the passports, we should see something. You gave them away, free diplomatic passports, not ordinary St. Lucian passports, free diplomatic passports. And St. Lucia got nothing in return for those passports. And these are the people who are an authority on CIP and on St. Lucian passports. It's right there in the audit. These very same people buying Mercedes-Benz Blue Tech L. So Mr. President, I want to, where is the forensic lab, Mr. President? There's no forensic lab. Sorry, there's no diabetic lab. There's no research lab free diplomatic passports. And Mr. President, you know, we are dealing with an opposition that is very destructive. Yeah. Very destructive. Yeah. The cultural center, everybody is aware how desperate this country needs to put the legal system back on track. Mm -hmm. Everybody is aware of that. The minute we said there is a location for it, it I don't think it would have mattered where we selected to put it the Labour Party would still take objection. I think if we put it in the sea, they would say they have sold that to Brineberg, so we cannot put it there. They will take objection no matter where you put it. You put it in the air, you will obstruct Liat. They will always find a reason. The people of this country, I know you are awake anyway. You are not going to let them fool you. You are not going to let them fool you. We need to put when we need to implement change in this country, the people of this country have 
elected this government because they saw the wisdom, they saw the proof in what we were going to um, provide for them. They have, they have their faith in us, they have confidence in us, and they have said, I am selecting you to lead me. And the people, the Labour Party, need to allow us to lead. They need to allow us to govern. They need to allow us to take the decisions that they couldn't take. Because you see, they want us to keep doing things their way, but it didn't work. That is why the country is in the mess that it is in. So we are going to take it out of that mess. And what do they do? They try to put stumbling blocks all along the way. Well, the Justice Department is going to be at the cultural center grounds. That is where it's going to be. Because that is where the government of St. Lucia has said it's going to be. The cultural center, we will find a place for the cultural center. And eventually, everybody will love it. People don't like change. But when you have an instigator pushing you and supporting you to even dislike that change even more, it makes things worse. But it's not going to work well for this country. Mr. President, there is another thing that people in St. Lucia may not be aware of, Mr. President. And while they have taken so much objection to this budget, and they've stormed out and the others didn't show up, Mr. President. You know what? This government, we include everybody when we are doing our activities, our projects, our programs. That's right. You heard the Minister of Culture telling you how these people were elected on the councils by all the elected MPs. Not me, not people like me, no. All the elected MPs. And sometimes when we send to us for them to participate, they turn it down or they don't respond, right? You know what we do? Anytime we get invitations to attend meetings, training overseas for parliamentarians, we take them with us. Mm -hmm. We take them with us, Mr. President, and you can attest to that. We invite the opposition, we travel with members of the opposition, mm -hmm. we go to the training sessions, we sit as a delegation, a St. Lucia delegation, yeah. and when they're out there, we are united, we are like one. And this is why sometimes people don't vote for people. Because when they know that you go out there and you sit with each other, you unite out there and you come home and you fight in each other, that sends the wrong message. We have to unite our people, socially, economically, politically. We have to unite our people. We must stop allowing the Labour Party to divide our country. We have to stop allowing them to do that. Mr. President, I want to take this opportunity to thank a remarkable woman, Mr. President, who has raised a formidable family. And she did it exceptionally well. Because one of the problems we have in society today is that the fabric of our society is broken. And this woman has raised an exceptional family. She continues to labor and give her time to the needy and the less fortunate in society in many ways than we are aware of because she does it from the bottom of her heart. She asks nothing back and you don't hear anything about her. Nobody knows she's doing all the work that she's doing. I know because sometimes I call on her when I have people that need things, when I need her to assist me with some purpose, and I know the amount of work she's doing, Mr. President. I wish to thank Mrs. Jane Dibole. The name comes up again for her dedication and hard work in helping poor people in yeah. this country, Mr. President. Yeah. She is a phenomenal woman. Because yeah. you don't hear a word about it, and she does it every day. I will wind down, Mr. President. I also wish to thank a gentleman <laughs> called Gasper, Mr. President. He sits in the boulevard. This gentleman started a feeding program on his own. Strong Labour Party supporter. Very awoosh, my friend, Mr. President. You know why he's my friend? Because I saw when he started this program and he's doing a wonderful job. Yeah. He has done something that most St. Lucians would not do. Mm -hmm. And he's not, he when he started, he was not getting a penny from anyone. He started doing this from his own hard work, paying him and the wife, feeding the poor in Castries. 
providing the number of meals he could on a daily basis. And this man, I tell you, Haitian Didain Blanc. Gaspar is doing a wonderful job for the poor people of Castries and the surroundings. He feeds them, he, he makes sure he provides them with a meal every day. Now he's getting you know, assistance from people and so on and so forth. But Gaspar started that on his own. And Gaspar years ago, and Gaspar is still at it. And I think that is really admirable. And I want to tell Gaspar today, I have not forgotten him. Because every now and then, and then I give him a little light. I have not forgotten him. It's coming. I've just been very busy. <laughs> Mr. President, I wish to wind down today by saying that we have a beautiful country. We have a lot to preserve and to protect in this country. I see people on a daily, ba on a daily basis who need help, people who are destitute. They come to the, right now we have the gentleman from the blast. He has been discharged from Victoria Hospital, but we have no place to send him. I say this because hopefully somebody will hear and come forward to assist us with this gentleman. And we have other St. Lucians, local people, who go through that sort of thing every day. So imagine when a person is so destitute and they get sick, and they come to the Ministry of Health, Mr. President. It could be mental wellness, and in the case of mental wellness, it is even worse because the people, you know, people are really afraid of people from, who have mental issues in St. Lucia. And sometimes it is not that, people should not be afraid of them. But we have to continue to do the good work that we do as a St. Lucian people. And there are a lot of St. Lucian people, Mr. President, who are good people. We turn to them with these people and their sisters with some of these people. And I want to say thank you very much today. Yes. I want to say to these people, thank you for assisting us with the sick people that come to us. We take care of them at, the, at our different health institutions, but they have nowhere to go. And some people assist us with these people, Mr. President. I also wish to say to people who have people, family and friends who are mentally ill, they must not turn their backs on these people. The healthcare system has no place to put these people. When they are sick, we take them to the mental wellness center. But once they are treated and they are OK again, their family must claim them. Their family must come forward and assist them. They must not just drop these people on the street because these people are human. These people have a mother and a father who made them just like you and I. And I want the families to come forward and take responsibility for their mentally, their mentally unstable family, relatives, and friends, St. Lucia. We cannot leave them on the streets the way that I see them roaming the place with nowhere to go. So Mr. President, as I end today, I am making a plea to St. Lucians that they must start supporting their government because they put the government in power, right? Your government is not going to lead you astray. And you have a prime minister that is phenomenal. You have a prime minister that is a true leader. He is not in it for the money. He is not in it for the power. He came in with all of that. All he wants to see is a better St. Lucia. He wants to see all of us on our feet, working hard to take care of ourselves. He wants us to develop national pride, and we have to be able to stand up as a people and be proud of who we are. I thank you. Leader of government business before you, before I call on you to speak. Um, and I know we, at this time, rounding down. Um, I would just like to bring it to Senator's attention. Um, standing order 37-4, and we need to be careful our choice of words, even if we may not be referring to specific individuals or per persons or members. Um, so I would just like to see that. And I'm, I'm 
saying it here because of the choice of words spoken by the Minister of Health. I don't think she attributed it to any particular, uh, to specific members, but um, I do not want the impression um, to, for us to leave here. Um, and I'll refer to the words when she said, um, um, St. Lucia does not want to be led by Alibaba and a bunch of thieves. Mind, I did not spec, my interpretation is not that she was referring to a specific group, but that she was making a general comment that St. Lucia should not be, okay, senators? So be, let's be careful what we say. Leader of government business. Mr. President, um, my colleague senators asked me the question, what is there to rebut when there isn't a, an opposition? But there is, or there are two independent senators, although there is not much to rebut because their contribution was more support and advice and more or less guidance. Very good ones for the, for the current government, which I appreciate very much. But I would have hoped, Mr. Pre Mr. President, that the three opposition senators would have made a contribution to the House today because I believe that they have a responsibility to the people of St. Lucia, not to the St. Lucia Labour Party, for making themselves present in, our, in the House of Assembly. And I think they need to understand that, that they are senators, not senators of the St. Lucia Labour Party, but senators for the, of the government and people of St. Lucia. So making yourself absent when there is a sitting of the Senate is a disservice to the people of St. Lucia. So I'm hoping that in the future that they at least show themselves up and make the contribution that needs to be made on behalf of the people. So unfortunately, there is not much to rebut, but to give some support to some of what has been said or was said by my former, for my, by my, by my um, colleagues. And just to say thank you to the, the independent senators. Now, Senator Oje started his, uh, his presentation by listing the five principles of governance of the United Nations good governance. Well said, of course. And I just want to talk about just one thing here when he speaks of the engagement where good governance should engage the public. And I believe the senator was making reference, I am suspecting, Mr. Um, Ms. Independent here, that you were, Mr. Senator, I think you were giving some hints. And I hope I am not wrong, that these five good governance principles, especially engagement, I tie it, I'm not saying that you were speaking specifically of the DSH, but I think that you had a DSH in mind when you <laughs> spoke of these five good, and it is good to discuss these things. But I must say to you and to the to the members, that the government has been engaging the public. But you know, the opposition has a tactic. They have a strategy in creating a lot of noise 
So the engagements that we have undertaken with the public, they are hoping that the engagement will be lost in the noise. But the people of St. Lucia, they have good hearing and they have good understanding and they know exactly what the mission of the St. Lucia Labour Party, the opposition Labour Party is about, what they're about, they understand. So we have engaged and we are listening. We have had, I think about three or four town hall meetings in the South, asking, uh, answering the various questions by the, by the um, constituents. You remember, Mr. President, when the DSH came out, the, there was a lot of noise about the mangrove. And I believe that was good noise and good agitation. And the government listened. The government listened. And the government went back to the investor and the investor listened to the government. This is negotiation. That's how you negotiate. But it's the hypocrisy with the mangrove. It was a dying mangrove. And nothing was being done to resuscitate life in that mangrove. But as soon as we said that we were going to have a project in the south, all of a sudden, the lovers of mangrove showed up. So we changed the plan. We changed the plan altogether. And then they moved from the mangrove to Maria Islet. Now, bear in mind, the government has not made any decision as yet, you know. The government is just in negotiation mode. The government has not said we'll be doing this, we'll be doing that, or specifics, I should say. But they're attacking various aspects of stuff in the project that has not been confirmed. But guess what? There is, there are, actually there are no more talks as far as the Maria Island is concerned. Now, they have absolutely nothing within or anything specific in the project to talk about. They talk about the project as a whole. And you hear the scare tactics. You hear them. Not under my, what? My dead body. This project will never, ever take place. Now they talk about the project, not any, anything specific about the project, but the project as a whole. Because we know, we knew very early, it had nothing to do with mangrove. It has nothing to do with Maria Islet. It has everything to do with the project as a whole. And as I said earlier, we as a government understand very well the impact, the social and economic positive impact it will have in the South and the people of St. Lucia. We know it very well. And the opposition knows it very well. And they are scared to death. They are scared. So they move around, they parade around, they jump around, they make noise. Trying to fool the people of this country with lies and propaganda. That's the modus operandi of the Labour Party. Anyway, as a student of economics, especially developing economics, I understand the importance of the environment, physical environment. I understand that. And in the, with development, there is always a clash between <coughs> nature and nurture. Always a clash, especially with projects with that magnitude. Always a clash. And the question is the balance. And you have to assess the critical need of that society. And what are you willing to compromise to achieve more than what you're compromising? You have to balance the cost and the benefit, or you have to weigh the difference between the cost and the benefit. 
And we know the ills Viewfort and the South are facing. We know. How do we create jobs in the South? How do we create jobs in the neighboring communities in the South? Where are the plans? Where are the policies? Where are the projects? What else if not DSH? For 20 years, nothing. And now something has emerged and you want to kill it? That won't happen. We will do what we have to do to ensure that you create jobs in this country. We will do it. Nothing will stop us because we are the workers, the workers of the United Workers Party government. Nothing will deter us because we are focused. We are focused. We came with a mandate and we shall deliver on that mandate. And as, as I said this morning, and we will not apologize for creating jobs for the people of this country. There is no apologies. We should not and we will not apologize for doing the right thing for the people of this country. Absolutely not. So I sympathize with the organization like the National Trust. I understand. I'm with them. But I'm also with the people of this country who are crying out for jobs, who are crying out for livelihood, who are crying out to take care of the children, their husbands, their wives, their grandparents, their aunts, their aunties, their nenens. They are crying out. And who are, they, who are they crying out to? They are crying out to the government. They elected. They believed in what we sold them, what we gave them, what we told them leading up to the elections. They believed in us. And we will not disappoint them. We shall not disappoint them. But we will do what we have to do responsibly. Of course we will. We will. We will. And when we said that we'll be building a new St. Lucia, we meant that. We meant it. So, Mr. Honorable Senator, we're engaging. But there must come a time when the government has to do what it has to do. There must come a time when we have to do, or we will do what we have to do. And Senator Francis Thomas, Thomas Tansis, thanks again for your in insightful um, recommendations as far as the tourism sector is concerned. And we believe a lot of the concerns that you brought out or you expressed will be dealt with with the concept of the village tourism in terms of developing the local crafts and local foods and we are we have great intentions in developing that sector the village tourism in fact we are reviewing incentives to provide the incentives in the tourism sector as a whole but more specifically for those for the tourism for the village tourism I understand the need for backward linkages and the development of village tourism and the tourism product that we have in St. Lucia will result in very positive backward linkages. It has been announced time and time again by the, by the Prime Minister that we will be building about additional 2,000 hotel rooms. Within, the, within this term. And we have and are developing a very liberal incentive regime. Because as a government, 
We believe that you should give the best and the most competitive incentives as possible to attract the investors. Because what you need, you'll make money out of what? The rooms. When the rooms are built, that's when you start making money. The government will collect revenue and jobs are created, more permanent jobs are created. Of course, the, during the construction phase you will have, or phases you will have jobs created. So we are not afraid of, of having very competitive incentive regime for the tourism sector. And if you can recall a lot of the SI, a lot of the SIs I read this morning, it had a lot to do with the local tourism investors. Local. Not just the foreign, but local. So they are taking already taking advantage of the the incentives within the tourism sector already. Now, Mr. President, I believe all of us on this side here has given much praise to our Prime Minister, and I believe it is well deserved. It is well deserved. I remember of uh, Senator Belrose said, made mention of how our Prime Minister has been abu abused. And she's right. I believe that he was the most attacked, viciously attacked, Prime Minister or even leader of opposition ever in St. Lucia. You see, Mr. President, when something big is about to happen. When something, someone great is about to establish themselves. You will always have people who will try to kill that promise. People who will try to kill that dream. And from the onset, our Prime Minister has been under, they have, he has been under attack. From the onset. They went beyond his, himself and they attacked his family. That's how nasty it is. They said so many things about him. But the most laughable thing they said was he will be, never become prime minister. They said, in fact, my good friend from Labrie, not over my dead body. I remember meeting him in Antigua shortly afterwards and I, I reminded him of these words. And he said, this is um, figuratively speaking. Figuratively speaking. They said that he would never become prime minister. They said that he cannot speak Patwa, so he's not qualified to be the prime minister of this country. But I have been around with the prime minister on various trips. And never at once, not once, Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. President, he had to speak Patwa to the people that he met. Not once. When he has to speak on behalf of the country, negotiate on behalf of St. Lucia. Not at once, not once he ever had to speak some Creole. Not once. But you know something, Mr. Prime, Mr. President? The last campaign really helped his patwa and his Creole. And he was able to say eloquently, you fashé, moi fashé. Eloquently. You see, sometimes when they try to kill the bill, 
when they try to cover you up, they lift you up. And it reminds me of a preacher who once said that a gentleman was placed in a pit, alive, and his oppressors Try to cover him alive. So what they did? Shovel by shovel. They threw him into the, the pit. And guess what the man did? Every time they threw in dirt on his back, he will shake up the dust, the dirt of his, of his back, and stamp on it. Every time they throw it, another one, when they throw another one, shake it off, stamp. And guess what? After a while, what happened? He was able to come out and get lifted up from that pit. And that's exactly what they did with the prime minister of this country. He was able to shake off the dust, the dust and the dirt off his back. And his back is broad enough. They even attack his education. They said he doesn't have a certain degree. In fact, they said the very same thing about me. You know that? The former prime minister, he did. Leading up to the elections in Kashris East, the man had the, the prime minister had the gall to say, or the gall, the gall, that my PhD is not in economics, it is in some regulation. That's why, let me tell you something. Sometimes you have disrespect for certain people. And it takes just something just to lose it. I've lost everything. Because when a man can go after a man's reputation, professional reputation, and he went further and attacked my career record, and he was making reference to my stint in the Turks and Caicos Islands. Talk about how I got fired and all nonsense like this. I remember walking the beach with my wife on, on, a, on a morning. And there was a, a beach cleaner, NCA. We are, we are, we are, we. She called, Lao Nipuete. Huh? Upani PhD. Huh? You're fire. You see how our leaders are actually misleading people and causing division and causing hatred? So it's about attacking your reputation, professional, otherwise. You know, I, and then I remember, I remember vividly what it did to others. What it said about John, um, John, John Compton, Sir John Compton. The things they have said about George Odlum. The nasty things they said about Sir Vaughan Lewis. They even attacked the number one reporter and talk show host, Timothy Polion. They go after you when they see that you are a threat. And that's exactly what they did with our Prime Minister. But you know, Mr. President, when God has a plan for you, no man can interrupt it. No man can interrupt it. Stumbling blocks will become stepping stones. No one, no one, nobody. And what I like about the Prime Minister, I am emphasizing this, Mr. President, because when you have a good leader, you have to praise him. Yeah. You have to support him. Because I know a bad ones do. You know a good one and a bad one? Yeah. When you get a good one, you have to praise him and support him. My Prime Minister, his back is very thick, not thin. And my colleagues will tell you in the cabinet, you'll disagree with him. You, will de you can't disagree with him. And when he's wrong, he will say, I am wrong. And he will say words like, 
I apologize. I am sorry. That's the quality of a good leader. He takes criticisms. And never once have my colleagues have ever spoken ill of him behind his back. Never. Unlike others I knew. Who would say all the worst things about the leader. And in the presence, they're tailing him behind. I know them. I don't want to be led by anyone who will not take my criticism. None. And when you take it, I have no fear that you will victimize me. I know a good leader from a bad one. You know, Mr. President, during the budget process, it was very painstaking for the ministers. Very painstaking. Because you have them coming with a wish list. I want this, I want that, I want this. And I always remember, when I have flashbacks of the budget process, I always remember the Honorable Minister of Foreign of, um, Home Affairs, <laughs> National Security. <laughs> always remember. <laughs> the man wants everything. And the Prime Minister would look at him in the eye and said, Minister, I just cannot afford. We just cannot afford it. And you go one by one with the other ministers. We just cannot afford it. That's a responsible Prime Minister. One who understands prudent fiscal management. Prudent good finance management and you remember they called they said to him that what they said he 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 cannot manage his the finances of his of his father's hotel all kind of stuff like that <laughs> will he be able to manage a country my goodness I, i'm telling you leader of government business i would like to draw to the senator's attention standing order nine three just bring it to your attention yes, yes. because at six. six I think I will end before six o'clock mr. president I believe leader, I will end leader of government I, I'm hoping leader of end. government business it's not just you ending before six o'clock the Senate has um, procedures to keep to so I'm just bringing it to your attention that we have things to do before procedures to keep before six all right? or else we would you would have to do what you have to do. Okay. Okay, Mr. President, I understand and I will wrap up very shortly before six o'clock. Okay. So, Mr. President, I was saying what we as ministers had to go through the budget process. And you know, Mr. President, the various needs and that were brought to the various meetings, budget meetings, were genuine needs by the ministers. When you talk about vehicles for the police force and a police stations and a courthouse and a kitchen for bodily and, and many other things. And the prime minister will say to you, I just cannot afford, the country just cannot afford. On the other hand, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, Mr. President, on the other hand, When the government has to write up a check to deal with the matter of Grindberg, it hurts me. It hurts me.
when the government has to have 150,000 US dollars as a retainer for the grand bird attorney in the US, a retainer, and when it falls to 100, we have to replenish. It hurts me. Because not only do we have our seabed in jeopardy, but we, we have nothing to show for it, and yet still we have to give up money that we don't have. And who brought this upon us, Mr. President? Who brought it upon us? Who brought this upon us? Okay, okay, I get you, I get you. Yes. Yes, Mr. President. I'm saying that we have so much, we have limited resources. Yes. Okay, go ahead now. Mr. President, I would like, I would humbly move for the suspension of standing order 9-3 to enable this Senate to sit beyond the prescribed time of 6 o'clock in the afternoon. Honorable Senators, the question is that this Senate, that Standing Order 9.93 be suspended to allow the Senate to sit beyond 6 o'clock in the afternoon. I now put the question, as many as are of that opinion say I, as many as are contrary opinions, you know, I think the eyes are it. Thank the you, Senators. Mr. Honorable we have four on this side here. Yeah. And just permit me, just permit me, because it's, it's something that's within me I need to get out. Because I just feel the pain of our senators, our senators and ministers. I felt the pain during the budget process. And I saw the great need that this country has. And where we have to spend the limited resources on a matter that had nothing to do with the people of this country, on a matter that had nothing to do with this current government, on a matter that had to do only with one person, one person, and the entire nation is paying for that. Time, nation. And the thing about it, Mr. President, we don't know how much Grindberg will cost us monetarily. We don't know. Because the lawyers are constantly fighting on behalf of the government, and we have to constantly replenish that retainer fee. We have to. We have to. So if it takes 10 years, we have to keep going. Is that fair? Is that fair, Mr. President? I don't think it is. I don't think it is, especially in this difficult fiscal situation faced by this country. So when the police officers realize that the vehicles that they needed are not in the parking lot of the police stations, they should remember Granberg. When teachers don't have the material they need to teach, they should remember Granberg. When nurses don't have the material to take care of the patients, 
they should remember Greinberg. When firemen don't have the fire trucks and the hoses and proper buildings, they should remember Greinberg and be angry when they remember Greinberg. Because we are throwing money in our ocean. We are throwing money we don't have in our oceans. And who caused this mess? Who did it? Who did it? Honorable leader of government business, you have 10 minutes left. I need, I need 10 more. I need 20, 10, 10 more. Additional. 20, 20. To be safe. Mr. President, I wish to invoke standing order 353 to allow the Honorable Minister in the Ministry of Finance 20 more minutes additional time to complete his presentation. Honor Honorable Senators, the question is that the leader of government business be granted an additional 20 minutes in which to complete his presentation. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. President. As many as are of that opinion, see, eh? Aye. As many as are of a contrary opinion, see, you no? Know? I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to my senators. And I know very well if I had asked for two hours, they'd have given me two hours. Because what I'm saying here is very, very important, extremely important. So, Mr. President, and one of the reasons why I have faith in this government is because we are strategic thinkers, very strategic thinkers. That's why I am 100% behind the Minister of Agriculture, 100%. Because we believe that if you are developing your tourism product, it must go hand in hand with the agricultural sector. And currently, I'm working with him in ensuring that finances are received by his ministry to undertake our agricultural feeder roads. We want our farmers to have access to the lands. Access to lands will increase acreage. Increase acreage will increase, hopefully, most likely, profitability, or profits. And of course, that will lead to greater employment or lower unemployment in this country. We want to build up the agricultural, the agricultural sector. And I have a natural love for agriculture. And now, now I'm not one, Mr. President, who, who boasts or brags. Or brag. I'm not one. I, I don't do that. But my first two degrees, my bachelor's degree and my master's degree, both were in agriculture, agricultural economics and agri agribusiness, respectively. And I'm saying this for a reason, I'll tell you why. And my second master's was in economics and finance and PhD in ec developing economics. I'm saying this maybe for the first time. Because the opposition gave me a different thing. <laughs> they gave me something else. Nothing, you know. So I, I'm saying it for the public record. So my great great, my great grandchildren, when they read the um, Hansa, they will know that this current opposition were liars and propagandists. So for the record's sake, and it's very easy to verify, you know, very easy to verify. Just call the schools, Alabama a and call and call Howard University, Department of Economics, simple, and they'll tell you, you know. But I have an affinity for for agriculture. 
and I will work hand in hand, glove in glove, with the Minister of Agriculture to see that the agricultural sector gets on its own, get robust and, and improved in this country. We are strategic fingers, strategic. Now let's compare, Mr. President, in 97, when you had the new labor. Let's compare. Let me, let me just give you one example. If you turn to page 90, pages 93, not 93, sorry. Uh, I want to show you, show you something here. Talking about strategic thinking. Where is that? Where is that? This should have been marked. Anybody with the book? I want to go into education, the school, number of schools in the country. Number of schools in the country. Where is that? Anybody with that? Page what? 68, is a table? A table? And I want a table, I want a table. I am wrong for doing that, oh. Where is that? Oh, I got it. It's actually pages 125 and 126. Well, 126 and 127. Mr. President, you would see in 97, 98, we had a total of 15 schools in St. Lucia, 15 schools. That is secondary schools. Oh, let me first start with the primary schools. We had a number of 84, 84 schools in the country. And a total number, or the total number of pupils, 31,437, to so roughly 31.5 thousand. In 2015, 2016, the number of schools in primary, primary schools dropped from 84 in 97, 88, to 74. A decrease by 10 schools, primary schools. And guess what? The population of pupils dropped from 31.5 thousand to 15,000, almost half. Almost half. Now, let's look at, let's look at the secondary schools. That's on page 127, table 67. We had 15 schools, 15 schools in 97, 98. And in 2015, 16, we had a total of 23 schools. So what should have guided, what should have guided the building of schools, of secondary schools in this country? The primary. The primary should have guided the building of secondary schools. Where was the strategic thinking? Where was the strategic thinking here? And what's the problem today? What are we facing? What are we facing today in our schools? We have overcapacity in our secondary schools. Overcapacity. And that's not only the problem, you know, Mr. President. You have school maintenance, and these are high costs, high expenditures. Where was the strategic thinking? But in the name of what? Universal secondary education. So we have provided universal secondary education. We have built more schools, but have we changed our curriculum? What is different from a, a student who graduated 20 or 30 years ago to a student who graduated today? What is different? What is different? What is different? What is the advantage that a student who graduated 20 or 30 years ago has 
or the students who graduated today has over a student who graduated 20 or 30 years before. What has changed? We are living in a technological era, age, and have we been able to bring into our schools these changes? Have we? So we boast about universal secondary education. What's that? What's that? So what should have been done, Mr. President, at the time is to undertake a demographic study, demography. You know? Do your, do your, your what they call the histogram, and you'll see where you are in terms of the size of the population, the age, and you'll know how to plan ahead. But you know what? There was no strategic thinking in that. None at all. Absolutely none. And today, we have secondary schools. I think now we are talking about, we're talking about the Grosley Secondary School. We're turning to a, a sports academy or a, academy. Yeah, an excellent center. A center for excellence. I bring up this point, Mr. Prime, uh, Mr. President, because in spending government money, we must be strategic. We must. So, Mr. President, I am very, very proud, very, very proud that in our short stay or stint in government, or a year, 12 months, we have made strides. And we are seeing signs of positive changes. Just recently, we had, there was an announcement that they are lower, we have a lower unemployment rate. Okay? We said that. Lower unemployment rate. We are seeing increases in our visa arrivals and even the expenditures too. We are seeing increased investor confidence. These are positive signs, aren't they? We are slowly getting there. We will get there. We will get there. We're going to ignore the noise out there, the opposition noise and the chaos. We're going to ignore that because guess what? We are focused. We are focused as a government. You know, and one thing about the prime minister, I understand why he put me in the, minist in the ministry of, of finance. I understand why. He want to make sure, and again, it's not about me. He want to make sure that whatever he does is above, is above board. There's accountability. There's transparency. It passes through me. It is not just one prime minister who does any and, any and everything he wants. There is transparency through the process. Transparency. That's the leader. We are not saying that we will get to the promised land in one year or two years. But we are getting there. We are getting there. And we are getting closer and closer and closer and closer and closer. We will get there. It doesn't matter what they say about us. We will be resolute. We will put our hands to the wheel. We will get there. And I want the people of St. Lucia to be patient with this government. And let the opposition do whatever they want to do. Let them do it. What are they good at doing? Opposing for opposing sake. Mr. President, I rise on a point of order. The point of order is 27, content of speeches. I think we have been very, very tolerant and um, accommodating in allowing the honorable member to deviate from the main matter at hand. Um, I think the time has come, Mr. President, for us to... Um, just, just repeat, because... I, um, which point of order? 37 content of speeches yes specifically to 
to the content of, of the honorable member's speech. I think he has been deviating from the main, I think he's, he should be rebutting in relation to the presentations we made today. But um, he's been bringing in other matters relating to outside um, matters and, and so on. So I just wanted to draw his attention through you, Mr. President, to this important fact. Good, Senator. I know you're wrapping up on the afternoon blues, we may want to call it. Please take note. Mr. President, I don't agree with the member of independent member. I don't agree at all because everything here is connected. Absolutely everything here is connected. I'm speaking about strategic thinking. Strategic thinking. I'm speaking about the ills of mismanagement of the past, which has an effect on our finances today it's they are connected you cannot no, you cannot erase the past because the past is affecting us today and we have to make reference to the past we must mr president we must because we didn't create this monster we are not the government that created this monster And the public must know where it came from, who did it, from whence it came from. So these are not disjointed arguments. They are joined. They are together. They are connected. So I respectfully disagree with you. And I solemnly do that. Let me, let me now inform you, Leader of Government Business, that you have 15 minutes in which to complete your presentation. I cannot disagree with you, Mr. President. You are absolutely right and always right. So, Mr. President, my government will continue to hold the mantle of governance of this country. We're going to hold hard. We're going to hold strong. We're going to push forward. We're going to climb if we have to climb. We're going to go through the mountains, through the valleys if we have to. But we have one destiny. We have one goal. We have a common goal among us. And that common goal is to improve the lives of the people of this country. And we will not do these things of this blindly, Mr. President. We will do it responsibly, understanding where we are and where we want to go, understanding the limitations that we have fiscally, understanding our boundaries. But we will get there. We will get there. And we shall get there. Thank you, Mr. President. Honorable Senators, the question is that the Appropriation Bill 2017-2018 be read a second time. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion say aye. As many as are of a contrary opinion say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. an act to provide for the services of the state of St. Lucia for the year ending on the 31st day of March, 2018. Leader of Government Business. Mr. President, since this is a money bill, I would beg to move that the appropriation 2017-2018 bill not be committed to committee stage understanding order 65, 
and that the appropriation 2017-2018 bill be read a third time and passed. Honorable Senators, the question is that the appropriation bill 2017-2018 be not committed to committee stage and that it be read a third time and passed. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion, say I. As many as are of a contrary opinion, say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Be it enacted by the Queen's Most Excellent Majesty, by and with the advice and consent of the House of Assembly and the Senate of St. Lucia, and by the authority of the same, as follows. This act may be cited as the Appropriation Act 2017-2018. Appropriation of 1,513,652,200 dollars for services of the State of St. Lucia for the year 2017-2018. There shall be and there is hereby granted to Her Majesty, the Queen, her heirs and successors for the year ending on the 31st day of March, 2018, the sum of $1,513,652,200 to be paid and appropriated out of the general revenue and funds of the state of St. Lucia for the said year in such quality, sorry, quarterly amounts as the Minister of Finance may consider appropriate and to be approved and to be expended in the manner and for the purposes mentioned in the schedule to this act. Leader of government business. Mr. President, I move that the Senate stand adjourned, sine die. Honorable Senators, the question is that this Senate do stand adjourned, sine die. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion, see I? As many as are of a contrary opinion, see no. <laughs> I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Senate is adjourned. All rise. And that concludes our Senate sitting for today, Thursday, the 22nd of June, 2017. Uh, just to recap, uh, on the floor for debate was the Appropriations Bill 2017-2018. It began uh, with the laying of the bill in the Senate by Leader of Government Business and the Minister in the Ministry of Finance, Honorable Dr. Ubaldus Raymond, uh, following which comments were received by independent senators, uh, Honorable Independent Senators Mauricia Thomas Francis and uh, Adrian Auger, they uh, proposed some recommendations to government for its policies and programs for the upcoming fiscal year and moving forward. Uh, we heard about uh, the the developments in the agriculture and physical planning sector as well as some of the issues facing the health sector and how government intends to respond uh, to overcome those challenges. Honorable Fortuna Bellrose uh, did give comments on her portfolio as a minister for local government, culture and creative industries, as well as the overall uh, umbrella ministry and the plans for youth development and sports. Uh, um, Honorable Herman Gil Francis did speak to the state of our uh, uniform services in terms of the St. Lucia Fire Service and the plans for new fire station as well as refurbishing uh, the old ones and some of restructuring that should take place with the St. Lucia Fire Service. And he did speak to some of the challenges and the way forward for the Royal St. Lucia Police Force and the judiciary as well. Uh, this certainly has been an informative session of uh, the Senate. Uh, do join us on Tuesday, that is next Tuesday, for the House of Assembly sitting from the Government Information Service. I am Alicia Ali. Thank you so very much for joining us and please stay tuned to the National Television Network.